Good morning, and uh, welcome uh, to this um, meeting of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. We're glad to have everybody here. The title of this one is, okay, in the outer provinces, shh, uh, this one is called Informing Blueprint 2.0. Please look up, I will explain. Um, I want to uh, thank the uh, Partnership for uh, Public Service for uh, hosting us this morning. We've become a, uh, an exploratory itinerant commission lately. Um, we're grateful always to our, uh, <clears throat> our hosts, uh, generally at the Hudson Institute, but it's really great to be here. If I may just say a word, uh, um, the, the founders of this Partnership for Public Service, which is unique, uh, are dear friends of mine. Um, Mr. Sam Heyman unfortunately passed away a while ago and his wife, Ronnie Fierstein Heyman, and they really did something quite unique here. And um, um, it's uh, very meaningful uh, to me to be here. So uh, let's begin. On March 11th, uh, 2020, after more than uh, 4,291 deaths from COVID-19 and 118,000 cases of COVID-19 uh, were confirmed in 114 countries, the World Health Organization declared that we were in a pandemic. Um, eventually, the, uh, came to, we came to understand it was the worst uh, in a century, uh, more than a century. Ten days ago, our own Department of Health and Human Services ended the public health emergency for COVID-19, and hopefully uh, there will not be a need to reconsider that decision. In any case, um, we can now look back and see that the public and private sectors working together in response to the uh, <clears throat> pandemic did some things that were really quite extraordinarily positive in mitigating uh, the effects of COVID-19. But, but we also know that uh, the reality is that globally more than, depends how you count, but the lowest number I've seen is more than seven million people died from COVID-19 and more than a million died in the United States. And more than, again, the more conservative number I've seen, 760 million people in the world actually got COVID. Those numbers are uh, painfully real, not theoretical, and they are uh, totally unacceptable. And so our commission, and of course many others, are asking now, what can we do to ensure um, that we do better, uh, notwithstanding how, how well we did in some ways, uh, the next time? And that's why uh, our commission is taking a look back at our foundational report, a national blueprint for biodefense, which was issued in uh, 2000. 15, uh, really working uh, toward updating it based on our experience in, uh, in response to COVID-19 and uh, a lot else. Uh, I say with some pride, but not any particular self-righteousness or arrogance, that we got a lot right in this report. Frankly, though this commission is extraordinarily uh, gifted and a wonderful group of people, it's not that we're geniuses, we just went out and asked the experts. And the experts told us we weren't ready for a naturally occurring uh, pandemic and here's what we should do about it. And, and uh, some of the things were done a lot, others were not. Some of the things that I'm uh, proudest of that were adopted may not be the, the more dramatic, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think in the, in the long and the short run, they matter. Uh, we, we recommended that there be a national biodefense strategy, which President Trump issued first, and then President Biden updated it, uh, and it's, I think, quite a strong uh, document. Uh, we also recommended to the White House and Congress that there be um, some uh, greater clarity of authority and responsibility 
um, with regard to biodefense activities. And uh, just uh, last December, uh, Congress uh, enacted, the President signed into law the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023, which contained portions of the Prevent Pandemics Act, which authorized and strengthened uh, biodefense activities at the White House and the Department of Health Services. And in, a, in a, a step that really mattered a lot to us, and I think will to our ability to respond to the next pandemic, but you know, it's, it's not and a recommendation of ours. The Biden administration just earlier uh, this year uh, released the first ever biodefense budgetary crosscut. I mean, we were startled to find that nobody could tell us how much are we spending on biodefense, where? And uh, uh, now uh, there's, a, there's a document, the and the federal government um, knows uh, how much taxpayer money is being spent on programs uh, that defend against pandemic diseases and uh, biological threats. Obviously, we're grateful to the White House, uh, succeeding administrations, and Congress for acting on those recommendations of ours and um, others, and we think they put, um, again, the administration and uh, Congress uh, on a footing to build on previous investments, particularly uh, the budgetary crosscut document, and how to direct uh, or redirect additional resources to strengthen um, our, uh, our bio uh, defenses. So we've called this meeting, please look up I give credit to our staff, headed by Dr. Asha George. We had a tendency to fall into great metaphors for titles from the Greek classics, the Apollo program, the Athena program. Now we're going into contemporary culture, specifically the movie Don't Look Up, uh, which was, as you recall, about uh, a, uh, a scientific fact being denied and then highly politicized. Hard to imagine such a thing could happen. Uh, but uh, that's why we're saying not don't look up, but please look up and on, on the basis of science and what we've all experienced, uh, let's figure out how to uh, make things um, better uh, the next time. So uh, today, um, which is our third on this focus on the updating of the National Blueprint for Biodefense. We've got a wonderful group of uh, witnesses who are coming before you. Some are government leaders at the federal, non-federal levels, uh, uh, talking about preparedness, including stockpiling, diagnostics, PPE. Uh, we can't uh, forget we, we lived with PPE like it was something uh, we had for breakfast every day. We, it's easy to forget now, but it was personal protective equipment and operational uh, coordination. We're also gonna hear from uh, some leaders on bio uh, surveillance from the private sector who are working to implement the latest advancements in technology uh, to our benefit, including wastewater surveillance, machine learning uh, prediction, and uh, uh, data modernization. So uh, uh, we, we're very fortunate to have you all here. And I think it's gonna be a very uh, beneficial day. I close with uh, one of the many favorite quotes from Benjamin Franklin I have. Uh, By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. And uh, we know the consequences of failure in this area, so uh, we're not gonna let it happen. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, really uh, delighted to see our, our commission co-chair, my dear friend, Governor Tom Ridge, and um, I would call on him now for any opening remarks that he would like to make. Thank you, Jim. Uh, first of all, you ought to know that among the many opportunities I've had in public service, Working with esteemed colleagues is a highlight of my public service career. I appreciate 
being associated with you and the, our extraordinary team we pulled together on this commission. And while all the topics our commission have addressed over the years have been very extremely important, I'm very interested in today's meeting. So I'll make my remarks short. That ought to generate applause. Um, first of all, again, based on experiences that I've had as a former soldier, as governor, and as secretary of Homeland Security, I know from real world experience how much of a difference early warning makes, good data and surveillance makes, and preparedness can make. And that's where we'll be focusing on today. I want to thank our speakers for taking time to join us today. You are an extraordinarily credentialed and distinguished group of panelists. I want to thank you for your public service throughout and for your work to make sure our nation and the world are ready for the next pandemic. We, we, are, we are very grateful for your presence today and the perspective and insight you will provide for us. Back to you, Senator. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, uh, Secretary Shalala. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me uh, oops, say a word about the partnership where we're located because I'm a big fan of the work that they do. They've done extraordinary work on transitions, uh, but most important, um, they're the only ones in this town that worry about implementation. And while the policymakers get all the credit, um, and that's where the action is in terms of coverage in this town, without implementation and without a, a, a government that knows how to implement uh, policies at every level, uh, we can't have the, the kind of governance or the kind of democracy that we care about. And that's what the partnership uh, focuses on. So I think it's a, the right place for us to be at exactly uh, the right time. Um, I want to thank Senator Lieberman, and it's nice to see our fellow commissioners. Some of them will be virtually as um, like Secretary uh, Ridge. Um, a month and a half ago, our executive director, Asha George, Dr. Asha George, and others on the bulletin of the American Scientist Science and Security Board moved the hands of the iconic doomsday clock to 90 seconds before midnight, the closest it's ever been. One of the reasons for this is that pandemics are no longer rare. They're no longer once in a century occurrences. Increased human animal interactions and changing climate are making diseases more likely than ever before to put the human population in danger. Meanwhile, advances in DNA sequencing, gene editing, and synthetic biology create opportunities for accidental, unintended, or deliberate misuses of novel technologies by creating deadly pathogens or disrupting current ecological balances. As nation states and terrorist groups continue to seek and develop biological weapons, we are worried. This rapidly expanding landscape demands our attention. We must keep our eyes open and to look up and to prepare this country to better defend on, uh, against the inevitable next biological threat. Some estimate that the economic impact of COVID-19 may be as high as $25 trillion. In just the second quarter of 2020, the U.S. gross domestic product, the GDP, fell by 8.9%, the largest single quarter contraction that this nation has ever experienced in more than 70 years. Two years ago, this commission called for a 10-year, $100 billion visionary investment in an Apollo program for biodefense that would develop and deploy the science and the technologies needed to prevent pandemics, no matter what their source. We argued that if this country acted now, the Apollo program for biodefense could effectively end the era, or perhaps I should say the eon, of pandemic threats in 10 years. This will certainly require leadership. It will require coordination, collaboration, and innovation in preparedness and, of course, surveillance for effective biodefense. So we must harmonize these efforts across departments and agencies and with state, local, tribal, 
and territorial governments, as well as the private sector and international partners. I'm interested in hearing from our speakers today about what they believe would better position this country to combat emerging and re-emerging biological threats. I'm well aware that some of today's threats are the same as those that this country faced decades ago. Sadly, everything old is new again. At just the same time, everything new is knocking us flat. But I remain convinced that the strategic investments and the policies made today, if implemented, can build on previous efforts to defend against biological threats and to protect our country and the world. Senator Lieberman, back to you. Uh, thanks, Donna. Thanks for that excellent statement. Next uh, member of our commission added relatively recently to great uh, positive effect for us, former Congresswoman Susan Brooks. Thank you, Senator Lieberman, and uh, hello to everyone. It's wonderful to be back in Washington, D.C. Um, I will tell you that when I was involved in uh, the reauthorization of PAPA, uh, which took many years to get finally across the finish line, I, um, working closely with Congresswoman Anna Eshoo uh, in the House, we relied very heavily on the blueprint. Um, and we took, we worked very hard to try to weave in as many of the recommendations as we could. And so that's why I'm so pleased to be a part of this effort as we are now ready for the next reauthorization of PAPA. And my, have we learned a lot. And now I think the question is before us and before the country is how do we really discern and figure out what we've learned coming through the pandemic? How do we take those lessons? And I think uh, particularly with our first panel, um, I've just finished work on the state of Indiana's Governor's Public Health Commission, um, where we did a deep dive into our public health system in the state of Indiana. And I know so many other states are doing that as well as we should. Our workforce is exhausted. Our workforce in public health is very much burnt out. They've learned a lot. We need to continue to focus. We need to make sure that the federal systems, the state systems, and the local systems are all coordinating like never before. I completely agree with everything uh, that uh, the previous uh, speakers have said, um, so I don't want to belabor it, but, but we have to do better. We cannot fall into that cycle of complacency and fall back. We have to take all of the things that we've learned. We have an opportunity with reauthorization of PAPA, um, with uh, a new Congress to be really focused on you know, getting ready for that next threat, that next pandemic, that next attack that sadly will occur in our lifetimes. So look forward, thank you all to our witnesses for coming here. Your incredible depth from the field and your experience and knowledge will help inform our next uh, version two of Blueprint and wanna thank the staff for getting us ready for today. Thank you, yield back. Uh, thank you, Susan. Former Congressman, former CEO of Bio, Jim Greenwood. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'll be brief because I want to hear the, from the, we all want to hear from the witnesses. When we issued this seven and a half years ago, I think we thought that the, we thought that the best case scenario was that Congress and the administration would take to heart these recommendations and enact them. And while as we knew a, a pandemic was, uh, was not only inevitable, it was likely to happen, um, that the, the, the numbers that, that, that Senator Lieberman uh, quoted in the beginning about the deaths here and around the world would be much lower. Um, I think we might have thought that the worst case scenario would be that um, not enough of our recommendations would be adopted, um, that there would be a pandemic, um, that it would take a terrible toll, um, but the country then would become united and Congress would do what it does best, go about the business of locking the doors after the, the barn doors after the horses are gone. Um, we're not united. We were not united by the pandemic, sadly, um, and many of those doors uh, remain open not only with regard to pandemic, but in uh, regard to uh, bio, potential bioterror events and other um, uh, kind of events. And so we're going to go about the business of, of hearing from witnesses again and updating this report. Um, and hopefully, um, uh, hopefully um, more of our recommendations, our new recommendations, and some of our old recommendations that still have not been adopted will be adopted so that when the next one comes, um, it will be, we'll have the best case scenario, and, and the next one may be more virulent and more deadly than the COVID. 
And so it's, um, it's uh, as urgent, if not more urgent, than it ever was. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And uh, last is Fred Upton. Uh, seeing Fred uh, first day of spring, uh, uh, Major League Baseball is in spring training. I would <laughs> officially declare you, notwithstanding your age, as our rookie of the year. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we will see how the season unfolds. Uh, lot, lots of hope uh, with yeah. our young arms. Right. Uh, uh, let me just say, I am very excited to serve uh, on this very important uh, commission. Uh, I look forward to the testimony as well. I'll try to keep my remarks short. Uh, as I look back uh, at what we experienced with COVID, I was a conduit. This was something that no one thought was going to happen this early. I was a conduit with our governor, with our health care providers, with our businesses, large and small, and holding hands with family members uh, who suffered. And we saw personally the, the tragedies, uh, not only in my congressional district, across my state, uh, across the nation, and, and frankly, across the world. And as I look back at what I tried to do, whether it was PPP, PPE, or PPP, that was another one, uh, to keep our small businesses afloat. Uh, we had to work together to try and get through the, uh, through the hurricane uh, because it was more than that uh, when things were all said and done. Uh, I look at my work as a former chair now of the Energy and Commerce Committee in terms of what we did, of which Susan Brooks was a member at the time when we passed uh, 21st Century Cures. We worked very closely with a fellow commissioner here, uh, uh, Peggy Hamburg, uh, on uh, getting uh, 21st Century Cures done. And of course, what it allowed was for companies like Pfizer and J&J &J and Moderna to actually get uh, an FDA approval of their vaccine for COVID approved uh, probably faster than before, but actually produced months faster uh, and available to the public maybe six to eight months earlier than it otherwise would have been, which frankly, uh, reduced numbers of, of who would have died uh, rather than significantly from what uh, Chairman Lieberman uh, indicated before. So, you know, as we look to the future, it's critical. It's so critical that uh, we learn from the experience that we did, that we, we do all that we can to foster relationships between state, local, and, and federal uh, folks, which is why this panel is so important. And I look forward to listening, answer some question or, or pose some questions and uh, be, be part of the scenario that moves us in the right direction come the future. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I'm just sorry that I can't be there in person, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll be listening intently uh, from my end of the phone. Uh, thanks, Fred. We're glad you can uh, be with us uh, virtually. Um, I wanna thank uh, Secretary Shalala for uh, agreeing to chair the first panel and invite the witnesses on the first panel to please come forward to the table. Thank you. We're joined by... extensive local uh, experience because he was the executive director and local health authority um, head for Harris County in Texas and um, also, uh, he was the chief uh, medical officer for Galveston County Health District uh, in uh, Texas as well. He's had a distinguished uh, uh, career and um, a lot of experience with hurricanes, if I could uh, uh, point out. Um, Dr. Gracia um, is president and CEO of the Trust uh, for America's Health which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public health policy and research advocacy organization that promotes optimal health in all communities. Um, their Ready or Not report series annually assess the state's level of readiness, which um, gives her a special insight. Their uh, new report's coming out in March, if I remember, the end of March. Uh, Dr. Garcia in the Obama administration was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Minority Health and Director of the Office of Minority Health at HHS. And she was also the Chief Medical Officer in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. So let me uh, welcome both of you and start with Dr. Shaw. 
Thank you, Secretary Shalala, so much. Great to see you again. Uh, good morning, Co-Chair Lieberman, uh, Co-Chair Ridge, and distinguished members of this bipartisan commission. It's fantastic to join you this morning, and I also want to um, thank my colleague here, Dr. Nadine Gracia, who has been a friend and colleague for years and really looking forward to um, being on this panel with her. Thank you for your leadership and for inviting me to share my observations to help inform the Bipartisan Commission's uh, National Blueprint for Biodefense 2.0. Public health never sleeps. Our state and our nation have faced many threats recently, the Omicron surge, the global MPOX outbreak, and the triple-demic of COVID-19, RSV, and influenza, and these were just recently. Amidst these and other public health emergencies, we have faced and tackled other challenges, including helping families locate infant baby formula, avian flu outbreaks, and a host of environmental health emergencies. These events and so many others highlight the need for smart, strategic, and sustained investments in public health infrastructure and support of our public health workforce. One that has been vilified, ridiculed, attacked to the point that many are unfortunately leaving the field in droves. The federal funding we receive each year enables public health to prepare and respond to a whole host of public health emergencies. These are not optional investments. These are compulsory for the health and well-being of our nation. We have just lived through a global pandemic that continues, that has taken over one million American lives and the lives of over seven million people nation, worldwide and counting. If ever, this drives home the need for a One Health approach, as well as the complex intertwining of global and domestic health. There's been undoubtedly both deep societal and economic cost to this pandemic. Some estimate well over $16 trillion in the United States alone. We were absolutely underprepared for a biological threat, as the 2015 National Blueprint warned. Yet, this was despite living through SARS in 2003, H1N1 in 2009, MERS-CoV in 2013, and now COVID-19 not to mention H5N1, Ebola in 2014, Zika in 2016, the latter two playing out before our eyes in my previous home state of Texas. We have lost a lot. We have lost time, we have lost trust, we have lost lives. We cannot underscore enough the importance of preparation, coordination, and investment in biodefense. Shame on us if we do not take what has been taught from this pandemic and other urgencies and transform our systems in real and sustained ways and rise reborn and ready to protect the health security of all Americans. What I have been saying for many months now is that there are two ways to see this pandemic end. One is to be transactional in nature where we do what we most Americans do. We go to the next headline, the next shiny object and we wipe ourselves and we simply move on. The other is to be transformational to take the summation, all the pluses and minuses, all the lessons that this pandemic have taught us, and to transform our systems. In the fall, at the Washington State Department of Health, we launched our transformational plan based on our cornerstone values of equity, innovation, and engagement. It is the start, and we must do so much more. But in this plan, we highlighted five priority areas. Two of those priority areas are very important to the work and the discussion today. One is health systems and workforce transformation, and the second is global and One Health. We're the first state health agency in the nation to make these one of our five pillars. My name is Dr. Umer Shah. I forgot to introduce myself. I've responded to countless emergencies over the last 20 years, including hurricanes and tropical storms, infectious disease outbreaks, chemical incidents, and even global earthquakes. I'm a public health professional, true and true, and a medical doctor who has been an emergency department physician at the Houston Michael E. DeBake EVA Medical Center, taking care of our nation's veterans for over 20 years. 
it is the most incredible opportunity that I have had taking care of our nation's veterans. I was also the executive director and local health authority for Harris County Public Health, the nation's third largest county with five million people, as well as past president of the National Association of County and City Health Officials, representing 3,000 local health departments across our nation. I'm a proud member of the Association of State and Territory Health Officials, state secretaries like myself across all 50 states and territories. And I served through the first year of the pandemic on the front lines in Houston before Governor Jay Inslee asked me to join as the Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington in December of 2020, home to nearly 8 million people. In fact, I started the week that COVID vaccines arrived in our state, and it has been a challenging journey since then, to say the least. I've served in both red and blue environments, whether left or right or east or west. Politics cannot get in the way of the fact that America must build a more resilient system, better prepared to respond to biological threats with bold leadership and vision. So a few points that I would like to expand on, and certainly I can provide more information in the Q&A period. First, investments can and do work. In Washington, we have made significant advancement in biosurveillance and reporting, whether data system modernization, digital disease reporting, or even wastewater biosurveillance. Tools have vastly improved. We have improved on our collecting of dots, but we still need a tremendous amount of work in connecting those dots through data aggregation and data integration. Secondly, Public health must be at the table in development of biodefense systems, including development of medical countermeasures, diagnostics, and therapeutics. This means when BART and other agencies are developing plans for medical countermeasures, we are the boots on the ground perspective and know our communities. We need to make sure we focus the so-called last mile as much as we focus on the first mile. So let me digress for a moment. Operation Warp Seed was a clear example of the best and worst of times, all in one. Public health must be leaned on for its expertise. While Operation Warp Speed did an incredible job to advance vaccines, the challenge is that it didn't do as good of a job in advancing vaccinations. We are a shared trust in public health and an investment. Third, with data advancement, we need a national framework to knit data streams together to maintain a ready state but also utilize these new systems for everyday public health challenges. We cannot go backward. Cyclical attention focus means cyclical investment, which is endangering the health and security of our nation. We build capacity after the fact in a chaotic, retrospective way rather than prospectively, proactively. Fourth, it is our also imperative that there is sustainable funding to maintain this modernized capacity, which includes new innovative partnerships, which I'd love to speak about in the state of Washington with many of our private partners, such as Microsoft and Costco and Starbucks and a whole host of other partners and the need for supporting the public health workforce, which again has been vilified, targeted, and attacked, and is now tired and leaving the field due to misinformation, misunderstanding, and active campaigns to discredit it. In fact, the de Beaumont Foundation has just released information that one third of the public health workforce is planning on leaving the field in the next five years. This is on top of the change in organizational turnover the last five years. Finally, in the fog of war against a biological threat, we are oftentimes at more risk from lack of coordination than lack of preparedness, and this includes lack of investment. There must be better coordination and interoperability across federal government and across all levels of government. We need one coordinated and robust incident command system across all levels of government, and we must all know not just the playbook, but which plays we are planning to run before we actually run them. Let me conclude by saying public health is a shared trust, often invisible when it does its work, yet necessary for the health security of our nation, and one that we must nurture and invest in in ways that we have not done before in a sustained manner but except for during times of crisis. It is time to sustain that focus and investment for the very health 
and security of our nation. The final point is, on behalf of the state of Washington, ask though my colleagues across the nation, I appreciate the opportunity to address this bipartisan commission today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Dr. Garcia? Great, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Shalala. Uh, to the commission co-chairs, Senator Lieberman, Governor Ridge, and to all the members of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the importance of federal policy in supporting the nation's biodefense at all times in states, localities, territories, and tribal nations. My name is Nadine Gracia, and I'm the president and CEO of Trust for America's Health, which is commonly known as TIFA. TIFA is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public health policy, research, and advocacy organization that promotes optimal health and well being for every person and community and makes health equity foundational to policy making. I'm honored to be here with Dr. Umer Shah, who serves on TIFA's board of directors. And I would be remiss if I did not also recognize commission member Dr. Peggy Hamburg, who is a past TIFA board member. We applaud the commission for its work over the past several years to call attention and, and raise solutions to persistent challenges in the nation's biodefense. And we look forward to the development of the new blueprint. For the past 21 years, TIFA has conducted research and published reports related to our nation's preparedness for diseases, disasters, and bioterrorism. Our 2023 report in, in the Ready or Not, Protecting the Public's Health from Diseases, Disasters, and Bioterrorism series will be released this Thursday, March 23rd. Our report includes an assessment of states across 10 key indicators of preparedness and outlines recommendations for federal policymakers and other stakeholders to improve our readiness. Over the course of the report's history, we have seen progress in many areas. Over that time, the country has invested in public health emergency preparedness capabilities in states and localities and territories. We've strengthened state public health laboratory systems for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. And due to these foundational investments, jurisdictions are able to respond to many events without the need to deploy federal assets. However, we know that our work is far from complete. Funding for public health and medical readiness presents an enormous challenge. Our Ready or Not report finds that funding for state and local preparedness has declined by more than 20% since fiscal year 2003, or by about half adjusting for inflation. Cuts to health care readiness have been, been even more drastic, with funding cut by nearly two-thirds over the past two decades after accounting for inflation. Although we applaud the incremental increases that have happened in recent years, we argue that these programs need major increases in funding. At the same time, the underlying public health infrastructure provides an inadequate foundation for effective responses. Our nation invests only an average of three to five percent of its $4.3 trillion in health expenditures on public health and prevention. We have no doubt that this chronic underinvestment contributes to the persistent increases in chronic disease rates and health disparities that put many populations at higher risk during public health emergencies. Due to this underfunding and because most public health investments are often siloed disease-specific funding streams, there has been minimal investment in cross-cutting capabilities. There has been very little funding for pressing needs such as communications, health equity expertise, and community partnerships, all of which are part of public health foundational capabilities. A recent study found that 80, 000, an additional 80,000 full-time equivalent positions are needed for state and local health agencies to be able to provide a minimum set of basic public health services. Another study released this month found that nearly half of state and local public health employees left their jobs between 2017 and 2021. This loss of expertise and experience cannot be restored with short-term staff once hired, only hired once an emergency is already underway. You may have read about health departments trying to receive and report COVID-19 data using phones, faxes, and Excel spreadsheets rather than modern health informatics. 
Public health agencies simply cannot contend with 21st century viruses and misinformation if they're using 20th century tools. Emergency supplementals truly are critical for immediate response needs, but they also present their own challenges. For one, Congress often writes this legislation so that emergency funding can only be used for specific purposes within the immediate response. For example, supplemental money provided to health departments for COVID-19 response could not be used to stand up MPOX vaccination clinics, even though the two outbreaks overlapped. Second, emergency funding also is often congressionally directed for specific purposes, such as COVID-19 testing or Ebola containment, and therefore could not shore up other public health capabilities or programs. Third, supplemental funding is by definition short term. Therefore, it is difficult for awardees to hire and sustain personnel in the long run. And finally, the influx of short-term funding can lead policymakers to believe that public health does not need additional money, even for activities unrelated to emergencies. Then they may cut base public health budgets at federal, state, and local levels. Public health agencies have become familiar with this boom and bust cycle of public health funding, but they should not be forced to resign to it to be resigned to it. TIFA's 2023 Ready or Not report will contain dozens of actionable recommendations for policymakers and other stakeholders. And for, day, for today's purposes, I'll, I'll highlight a few. First, Congress should treat funding of public health and biodefense similar to other defense spending. We support mandatory funding for cross-cutting public health infrastructure and workforce. We don't tear down firehouses as soon as a fire is put out Yet we do this to governmental health agencies. Public health experts estimate that $4.5 billion per year is needed to enable health departments to develop foundational capabilities of public health. Proposals such as the Public Health Infrastructure Saves Lives Act would create a predictable, accountable investment in these foundational capabilities. We also support the proposal from Resolve to Save Lives to create a health defense operations budget mechanism this would exempt critical biodefense programs from annual discretionary budget caps and ensure these activities receive sustainable resources. COVID-19 response bills are jump-starting significant innovations, including the creation of CDC's Center for Forecasting and Outbreak Analytics and investments in public health data modernization. But these will face a funding cliff in three to five years without sustained resources. A health defense operations budget could mitigate those impending cliffs. Second, federal agencies and their partners should infuse health equity into preparedness and response efforts in tangible ways. Health equity cannot be considered separate from emergency response activities. And some examples of this include requiring health equity expertise within the incident management structure whenever an emergency operations center is stood up. The COVID-19 pandemic was the first public health emergency that had a chief health equity officer at CDC, and we hope that this is embedded in responses moving forward at all levels of government. Making certain disaggregated, completed data, uh, complete data collection and reporting are also central uh, to data modernization and biosurveillance efforts. Equitable responses to public health emergencies truly are not possible without disaggregated demographic information. But this is going to require continued investment in data modernization and addressing policy barriers to collecting and sharing accurate data. Another example is resourcing community partnership and engagement for preparedness and response. Many of the effective COVID-19 vaccination and testing efforts at the community level were due to partnerships between public health, healthcare, community-based and social services organizations. If we want true and authentic community engagement in preparedness and response, funding and engagement must reach the communities that serve and represent those communities and that are trusted by the community. Finally, policymakers should invest in effective public health communications. Our nation stands at a tipping point where entire communities may distrust public health guidance and where misinformation moves faster than science-based information. We need greater investment in research and development of effective communications. 
We need to hire more communication staff in public health agencies, and we need to partner with and provide resources to trusted non-governmental partners to assist in message development and delivery. I thank the commission again for the invitation to be here, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank, thank you. you. Two superb statements. Uh, Senator Lieberman, do you have some questions? Uh, I would yield back to you if you want to start, but if not, I No, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you both. I agree with uh, Secretary Shalala, both excellent statements. So um, I thought it was, uh, both of you talked about biosurveillance, and um, so I, I want to just focus on that uh, quickly for a moment. Uh, Dr. Shah, you, you talked about some uh, biosurveillance uh, advancements that you put into effect in uh, Washington State. Um, tell us a little about them. And, and I'm, I'm interested, obviously, both uh, because of both charges that this commission has, both for a naturally occurring pandemic and then the different kind of biosurveillance um, that's necessary uh, to detect uh, a bioterrorist attack, for instance. Thank you, Senator Lieberman. So a couple of things of our journey has been about. One is the ability to understand what's happening in the ecosystem. And we have done this for years when it comes to our sentinel work for influenza. You know, the ability to detect what's happening with flu across our state, which is similar to what's happening across the country. The, the goal is to understand trends that are happening as patients are coming into a clinic, they're coming into an emergency department, they're coming into a hospital. The trends then allow us to make certain decisions. Those decisions are twofold. One is population health decisions to say here, here where we're, we're seeing increases in transmission, we're seeing, uh, as Dr. Gracia mentioned, inequities. So there are challenges with certain communities. We're trying to understand and underscore what are those preventive efforts and what are those protections we need to put in place. But the other is to also empower the individual. And I think that's oftentimes gets missed, the ability for individuals to take information and empower themselves to be able to take certain actions. So what do we do? What have we done during COVID-19 that has been so different? Well, what's been so different is that we've had investments in ways that we have not had prior. So we built systems along with our partners that were called, we always put a WA in front of everything in Washington, so it has to be WA, WA Verify, WA Notify, WA Health. All of these are systems that we built in the midst of COVID-19. Let me unpack a couple of those. WA Verify was a system to essentially say, what are, what are the, what's the vaccination status of an individual as they're going into certain activities? It was an ability for people to very quickly with a QR code be able to demonstrate that they have right. been vaccinated. While Notify was a tool that we worked with Google and Amazon on that was on smartphones and we had downloads in the millions in the state of Washington that was not Big Brother looking at the surveillance system, but it was really your phone Bluetooth technology providing biosurveillance. In other words, I tested positive for COVID-19, the phone knew that I was in contact with an individual and would go ahead and notify that other individual's uh -huh. phone that there was a positive COVID-19 outcome. And you'd be notified if, if he, it was the other individual. That's yeah. correct. And I have an example of a story of that where I flew from Seattle, a colleague of mine threw, flew from another part of, of, of Washington. We met at O'Hare Airport literally for several minutes. And then we came to Baltimore for a meeting, and there were only two other individuals from the entire state of Washington that were at this meeting. I don't believe I really interacted much with them, but when I got back home, I had a text alert, a, a sorry, alert on my phone, a notification alert that I had been in contact during the time that I was in Washington, D.C. area with somebody who tested positive. Oh. I couldn't figure it out. And then I found out that that individual I had met at O'Hare Airport for literally several minutes had tested positive for COVID-19. Uh -huh. The system works. But these are investments that we put in play in the midst of COVID-19. And the last one I would talk about would be wastewater surveillance. This is an opportunity of looking at trends across systems where people are not 
determining yes or no or this or that, but it's really the trends in a population health manner that you can say in this community or in that community, we're having increases in wastewater detection of biosurveillance materials that allow us to look and supplement all of the other activities that are happening as part of the system. So all of these are investments. The biggest concern is that many of those investments start to go backward the moment the emergency starts right. to recede. Thanks. Dr. Gracia, uh, why don't you talk a little bit in response to what Dr. Shah said but, uh, in terms of the work that the uh, Trust has done and perhaps a little advance on this report that you talked about. And, and uh, I guess I'd ask you and then Dr. Shah if he wants, um, what, what can the federal government most do to improve uh, biosurveillance? Thank you, Senator Lieberman, and, and I appreciate Dr. Shaw's example because it, it demonstrates what can happen with this investment in data modernization. And as I described in my opening remarks, the challenge has been actually having the resources for this type of data modernization. This is core to public health infrastructure, both for um, trends and being able to monitor health threats in non-emergency times as well as emergency times, and also to be able to determine which populations are being disproportionately impacted so that you can also then target resources, investments, strategies to be able to support communities that are being disproportionately impacted. Some of the challenges that we see in the data infrastructure is that it's an antiquated data infrastructure. The investments that have been made through the COVID-19 emergency legislation are important uh, investments that can serve as the down payments that are going to be needed really for the longer term sustained inf investment into this infrastructure. Was another challenge that we see is also not only the antiquated nature of the, of the infrastructure, but also the interoperability of, of that infrastructure. So Dr. Shaw pointed out, for example, the data that you have within the, health, the public health departments, it's ensuring that those data are interoperable with the health systems data in hospitals and clinics right. and, and other components of clinical labs and other components of the health ecosystem. And then that there's also interoperability and communication and collaboration across levels of government, local, state, territorial, tribal, and federal government. The challenges that we see are having not only accurate and complete data, meaning that we actually have data that is disaggregated by a host of demographic variables that will really give us a clear picture on what is needed to be able to address a public health response, but that it's also timely uh, and, and able to be communicated to those that need that communication. And so uh, specifically within Trust for America's Health, we are advocating for that type of investment, continued investment in data modernization. Uh, there's legislation, for example, in Improving Data and Public Health Act that will help to provide that continued investment in data modernization, but also looking at the data authorities as well. There's concerns, for example, that with the end of this public health emergency, ensuring that there's not, we're not going to return to the patchwork of data reporting and implementation that really helps to provide for an effective response in, in, a, in any public health threat. Thank you both. Very, uh, very helpful. Uh, thank Senator. you to both of you. You didn't mean to leave out, Dr. Shaw, the doctor's offices in terms of the reporting process. Absolutely not. Yeah. That's one of the traditional ways in which we got initial information. That's right. And I think one of the challenges that we've had, and Dr. Grassi just mentioned, is that how do we have the health ecosystem with public health, what's happening in public health agencies, also working in, in a collaborative fashion with the healthcare system. So as physicians, we have this, you know, all the time. We recognize the absolute importance of it. But the challenge that we have is that when you're not in a crisis, those systems oftentimes are not talking to each other. Those individual leaders are not designing systems that work with each other. And then we, after the emergency ends, we go back to our silos and we don't work with each other in the same way that we should. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Governor uh, Ridge, do you have a question? Uh, Governor Ridge, you need to turn on your mic. <laughs> nope. Unmute. Yes. Go okay, ahead. I apologize for that. I apologize to my colleagues and to the witnesses for not being in attendance as well, but I very much appreciated the powerful testimony. Dr. Shah, you referred to public health being a shared trust. 
And to that end, I would like to ask uh, both of your questions with regard to that shared trust. Dealing with the uh, COVID crisis, and I might add probably the fentanyl crisis, which is a pen uh, epidemic of sorts, uh, are there any differences in the relationship you had with CDC or NIH dealing with these? Because it, you know, it's quite obviously the one gets more public attention than the biodefense side. I'm interested in your perspective with regard to that shared trust and whether or not the CDC relative to uh, COVID has lived up to your expectations. And if you wanted to uh, make some improvements in that relationship, what would it be? Um, why don't we start with Dr. Garcia? I doubt if it's been perfect. Question, and then we'll go to Dr. Shaw. Thank you, Governor Ridge, for the question. I think what uh, you have really pointed out is the fact that public health works on many issues simultaneously. You pointed specifically to an infectious disease outbreak of pandemic proportions of COVID-19, to also looking at the epidemic of substance use uh, in this country, and, and that is one that is Trust for America's Health. We are also um, deeply concerned about. It's an area of work that we are engaged in uh, through our Pain in the Nation initiative to really address the prevention uh, of uh, substance use uh, disorder as well as suicide. Um, in particular, I would say with regards to the shared trust uh, with public health, and importantly, the relationship in working with CDC. Uh, certainly, we have engaged with CDC uh, since the beginning of our, uh, our organization being founded because of the leading role that CDC has with regards to promoting and protecting uh, the public's health. I think you, as you, certainly this commission is well aware, uh, this has been uh, an unprecedented pandemic for the nation and so many lessons that have been learned. Uh, CDC, through its director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky herself, has really taken accountability and understanding where there has been progress and where there are areas needed to improve. And so the launching of the Moving Forward initiative to enhance that accountability, to enhance communications, to enhance timeliness, these are all components to really help us strengthen and have a robust public health system. And I think that's the case at all levels. Uh, and so when we speak about um, the shared trust, an important aspect of this is trust uh, also is importantly built, uh, more importantly, prior to a crisis. And I say that at, at all levels, in the community, uh, to the state and, and uh, federal levels. And even in my uh, time in federal government in responding to uh, various public health emergencies such as the Flint water crisis or the Zika crisis, see the relationships that public health has that were established prior to these crises that could be then enhanced during the time of crisis to be able to mobilize with communities, to share information, uh, to really have a meaningful table in which to address these types of issues. That is going to be critical, and that's critical for us moving forward. And so ensuring that uh, public health as a system and agencies at all levels have the support of elected and appointed officials of commissions such as this to be able to do that work without interference, uh, inappropriate interference, for example, a political interference or other politicization of public health is going to be so important for us moving forward to ensure that we recover uh, in a way that strengthens our public health system uh, in, in the future. Dr. Shaw. I think Dr. Gracia has summed it up very nicely. What I would just add is that uh, it has been a work in progress and working with our federal agencies. And, you know, again, when we go back to um, uh, Governor Ridge, this, this concept of um, the lack of investment or the underinvestment over the, the decades, this is not something that was created overnight. This is a systematic issue at the community level, at the local level, at the state level, at the territorial, at the tribal level, and at the federal level. And so I think one of the biggest challenges that we have, and you all know this, is that we have to really connect those dots of what's happening at the federal agencies with what's happening with the community member on the ground. And that is oftentimes very difficult to do. And yet, um, policymakers do it all the time. Constituents, constituents matter constituents, their lives, their interests, what's concerning to them is of critical importance to policymakers. 
And yet when we're at federal agency level, it's hard to make that connection. And so we have to do a markedly better job of making those improvements of what's happening at that federal level to what's happening with the, commu the community, the end user. And then the final point related to this is that Dr. Walensky has very much outlined this is a plan to reform what the CDC has meant. And we all are hopeful that that is going to not just sustain in terms of the policy changes, but in terms of how the policymakers look at investing in that very agency and all the, all the ecosystem at the federal level so that we can truly have a robust system of response, but also of preparation and preparedness. Thank you. Uh, Representative Upton. Fred? Well, thank you. Um, I think to save some time, I might ask a couple of questions and then uh, listen to the answers rather than have a, a give and take uh, with, with each of them. So let me pose them this way. Uh, first of all, thanks for your testimony. I too regret deeply that I cannot be there in person. Uh, Dr. Shaw, I, I'd be, you know, Jay Inslee, your governor, it was a good friend of ours. Uh, he served on our, on the powerful energy and commerce committee before he ran for, for governor. And I'd be interested to know what your thoughts are in terms of the relationship of the now chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Kathy McMorris Rogers from your home state, as it relates to uh, some of the things that you indicated in, uh, to try and build a relationship where in fact uh, we, we can help. Uh, the second question that I have uh, goes back, that, that's wonderful your description of the connection by by iPhone as, as to whether people could be vaccinated or not and, and being able to get notices. And we saw the same thing in Greece. Uh, I met with the Greek health uh, administrator uh, and that's how they set up their whole system was with iPhones. Whereas here in the US at the time, we're all, we were using those almost the two by two cards where a doctor would actually fill it out, sign it. You'd, be responsible for having it in your wallet or showing it at a sporting event. It was, it was a crazy system and goes back to we're actually using like 18th century uh, data rather than the data that's available today. And I'm curious to know how many other states embarked on system on a system like you all did in the state of Washington. Uh, third, I can remember an old cable show, and this isn't quite the name of it, but it was like shittiest jobs you never wanted. And it showed some just awful, awful jobs. And one of them I can remember was a guy cleaning the sewer system in New York. And he had all these rats and, you know, crap floating around and, and everything like that. How does the system, when you measure wastewater, uh, and I, you see periodic reports on this, there's polio is coming back. I mean, how do you possibly trace what is in the sewage system, knowing in the system where you might have millions of pipes, uh, you know, dumping that stuff. Uh, how do you possibly trace where it is coming from and who does that job? Now, I know that cable show I don't think is around anymore, but I'd be interested in, in your expertise on that. And, and lastly, uh, uh, Dr. Gracie, uh, I know that you're going to share your report, uh, ready or not. I look forward to it to come the end of the week. Uh, you're so right in community efforts uh, to be involved. I know that uh, I got my, I think my first or second booster in our community college. I, I was lined up outside for considerable length of time. Hundreds and hundreds of people were there. The National Guard actually was called in by our governor to, to help. We had our little two by two card. We went from table to table. We got rolled up our sleeve and we got the injection. Uh, it, it's critical that those public health, local uh, public health uh, folks be engaged. And we're all so troubled uh, by the facts that we're going to be losing so many because they are exhausted. They were underpaid. They saw these tragedies day after day after day. And, and what what is it that we can do to try and make up for that balance? So with that, let me yield uh, my the time that, that I have remaining to, to you both uh, to answer those questions. Thank you again for appearing. Could, could you answer uh, these complicated questions as crisply as possible? Yeah. 
<laughs> Representative Upton, thank you so much. We have so a five-minute rule so, in the House yeah, of yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. As, long as, as long as it's not the five-second rule at yeah. the House, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so thank you for recognizing Governor Inslee and his uh, both his leadership as well as his continued quest to push us to, to go further. In fact, as we launched our uh, transformational plan, uh, and I have a few copies here if uh, the, the committee would like to to, um, to read it, uh, one of the things as he, when he was reelected, he said in his state of the state, was that he really wanted us to reimagine public health and to really think about what does that mean for the future. And so as far as, um, as you're, you're, you're contrasting with other leaders, what I would say it's gonna take all of us. And I've been in, as I mentioned in my testimony, been in so many environments um, that have been very different um, East Coast, West Coast, or what's happening as we sometimes call the flyover states or states that are, that are different. And the themes, though, are very similar. We are all trying to do the right thing. We just disagree on how to get there. And we've got to find ways to build those bridges to be able to do whatever we can to work together. And partnerships is a key area of that. And the private partnerships, uh, particularly, as I mentioned, the ones with, with the Starbucks and the Costco's and the, and the um, uh, Microsoft's, the other one was with Amazon. Amazon World Services did a fantastic job. We were trying to get our COVID tests out uh, to, we wound up shipping out about 15 million tests over time. Um, and Amazon World Services, guess what? They got them to Washingtonians the very next day. And if you ever had positive social media comments, it's when somebody received their test the next day from the government. And that was shocking. And they didn't even know what to do with it. So all they had it could do was say thank you. And that was so incredibly gratifying. So I would just say that we can do better and we can do things. But shame on us in government if we're not willing to take that private sector and harness that private se sector help. Starbucks said to us, look, when we were set, standing up for mass vaccination sites, the governor said, we need these up in 48 hours. Starbucks said, gosh, you know, we know we can get lattes and coffees in the hands of people 35% more efficiently. We can help you with your mass vac sites. And they were right. Shame on us for not being willing to take those on. The final two pieces were related to other states. Uh, there are other states that are following, and we follow at times together this road of innovation. And I think it's so critical to be able to do this. We are by far not the only state, but we have certainly invested in the innovative partnerships, but also the technologies to be able to move forward. So happy to talk through. and I. I believe Dr. Grassi may even have some examples of those states as well. And then finally, with wastewater, I would just say that it is a difficult job when you're the end person trying to, to do the wastewater pieces. But I will tell you, fortunately, those collection systems don't work like that. They're automated systems that actually give you trends of what's happening within the wastewater that allows you to detect in a more population robust way the ability to determine whether there's an increase or decrease in the bio surveillance materials that you're looking for. I hope that helps. Thanks. Thank you for the question about uh, the workforce and, and some of the critical needs around the public health workforce. As many of the issues we're describing today, this has been a longstanding challenge with regards to uh, the understaffing of public health. And we saw, in particular, a significant decline in the workforce and, and, and lost positions uh, after the 2008 uh, economic recession. And public health was not able to uh, really restore those, uh, those positions, and uh, a lot of that due to the chronic underfunding of the system. Uh, again, when you have these emergencies, there's often this uh, bolus of funding that is provided for the emergency, but it's short-term funding, and so it's hard to maintain. Uh, the expertise and the experience of staff who can perform these cross-cutting capabilities in state and local health departments and so entered into a COVID-19 pandemic in which we were already understaffed and, and we're now seeing, again, continued uh, loss of public health workforce, burnout being one of the reasons Dr. Shaw spoke about as well, the issues around the harassment and attacks of, of the public health workforce that has also transpired. I think there are important investments being made. Um, CDC recently uh, announced uh, awards of over $3 billion on infrastructure and workforce uh, that is now deployed and, and, and being able to support uh, our state and local health departments. That is an important investment to make. Yet again, we have to ensure 
that those investments are sustained beyond this first uh, uh, infrastructure and workforce uh, grant. Uh, there are other efforts, for example, such as the partnership between CDC and AmeriCorps, having the public health uh, core that is also helping to bolster uh, that public health workforce. But indeed, we need to think about this workforce as really a part of our national health security, and that when we see these declines in the workforce because there isn't the sustained, predictable funding that is then challenging for health departments to be able to recruit and retain that workforce, that needs to be a, a central and key focus as well. So some of these efforts, uh, this initial uh, funding through, through CDC's infrastructure uh, grant and, and workforce grant is, is critical, and that should be maintained in future investments to, to sustain that funding. Thank you very much. Representative Brooks. Um, Dr. Shaw, you talked about, and it sounded so much like the phrase that came after the 9-11 Commission about collecting the dots, but we didn't connect the dots. And that's what we heard after 9-11 all the time, that federal government agencies did not connect the dots. Can you expand on the dots that you believe need to be connected? We're collecting a lot of dots, but can you expand on that? And then, um, Dr. Garcia, with respect to the funding, how do we make the arguments to the appropriators about treating, what are the best arguments we can make about treating this like national defense spending? Where we come together as parties, where we support our troops, where we support our national defense, what are some of the arguments you would like us to make, and maybe they'll be in your report, which we're all anxious to read as well. What are those arguments where we can pivot rather than going from that Zika funding, that Ebola funding, all these different supplemental funding, what are the best arguments you could help us make? Representative Brooks, thank you so much for asking that question about collecting and connecting those dots. I, um, there are so many different ways of going with this one, and so I tried to put a, a little graphic down, and I was trying to scribble to make it make sense to me. So I think there are absolutely the connections that are required across the, the federal agencies. And so when Dr. Grassi and I speak to equity and we speak to these, what we oftentimes uh, refer to as these social elements that impact health, whether it's transportation, housing, education, um, jobs, empowerment of, of, of uh, economic might, all of these come together, and yet they're different agencies that have all this data, that have all this information. And so whether it's Department of Education, or just Department of Transportation, or HUD, or whether it's the CDC or HHS, or some, some other uh, component of the health ecosystem, all of those have different sets of data points. And so connecting those dots is one, one aspect. The other is connecting the dots all the way down from that global, this is so critical for global domestic health, and we oftentimes stop at national or federal, but global, national, federal, and also looking at that state, regional, obviously tribal and territorial, as well as what's happening at the local level, and then connecting that to the community level, what's happening with many of those community-rooted organizations that very much know what's happening in their community, being able to connect those dots of what the social aspects, the health aspects, all that coming together to the end person in a community. And then finally, it's this interconnectedness of other parts of the health ecosystem. And it's what's happening in the healthcare, the medicine, the hospitals, the healthcare system, which again, ha gets the majority of the funding. And yet, knowing that in the midst of not just emergencies, but urgencies, we have so many opportunities for us to make sure that what's happening in the public sector, the population health systems, are also interconnecting. Look, I was an ER doc for 20 years, and I felt very strongly it was about the individuals, but over time, I started to realize that those individuals represented a collective. So while we do need to know about the trees, we absolutely need to be concerned about the forest as well. Thank you. Representative Brooks, thank you for that question uh, because it is certainly something that we focus on intently is how do we maintain attention because we know once the emergency ends, uh, attention may wane and we move to other competing priorities. And I think there are some key strategies at all levels that we can be using. One certainly are the data. 
uh, and not only um, the health data, but also the economic data. Uh, we can look at this pandemic. Senator Lieberman, in his opening statement, noted it, a million lives lost due to this pandemic. That's a million lives lost and many, many more families, friends, colleagues, communities uh, that truly have been devastated by those lives lost. And knowing that we stand for more to be able to assure, assure that we can promote and protect everyone's health in our nation. But that's not unique to the COVID-19 pandemic. We see this every day from chronic diseases, from other infectious diseases. And so ensuring that we have a robust public health system that is able to actually protect and promote health in non-crisis as well as in crisis. We can also look at the impacts of these investments with regards to lives saved. For example, there was a study that showed, for example, through the vaccination program that it prevented 3 million deaths. It prevented 18 million hospitalizations. It saved the economy a trillion dollars. And so pointing to uh, what we actually also gained by having these types of investments and why that's so critical. Even before the pandemic, uh, public health emergency experts were citing how an infection pathogen can cross the entire globe in less than 36 hours. And so we need to recognize how interconnected that we are. And so ensuring that that health security apparatus really is in place for us and not trying to create it once the emergency happens because then you're building up on a, on a broken foundation as opposed to a strong foundation. We also should be citing success stories and showing what public health does on the everyday basis. In the state of Ohio, for example, the measles outbreak that happened in the state of Ohio, uh, where there was immediate uh, investigation, contact tracing, partnership between the state and local health departments and the CDC to be able to track and trace where those infections were happening, where the cases were happening, to be able to do the outreach and vaccination and for then Columbus Public Health to be able to say that the measles outbreak has now ended. That is what public health can do when it has the resources, the investment, and the support to be able to address those types of emergencies. We can see how a pandemic can not only lead to these health impacts, but they can also have devastating economic impacts. So being able to bring together the, those data with the success stories and really tying that to the overall infrastructure of our nation to assure that we are strong and well prepared for any public health threat because the threats are increasing, they're not decreasing. And it's not only infectious disease, it's weather related events, it's natural disasters and other crises that we face as a nation. Thank you. I just wanna share this morning, the New York Times, um, there is a five minute video about PEPFAR and President Bush's program that saved 20, has saved 25 million lives. And we don't talk enough about the lives we're saving, and that may be, I think, an incredible way to talk about what we've done and the lives we've saved, and we don't focus on that enough. Thank Secretary you. Secretary Shalala, if I could just add one, yes. one final point here. Um, Dr. Garcia moved me to say this, that I say this a lot, that we are the offensive line of a football team. And everybody that focuses <laughs> Everybody focuses on the quarterback. And so yeah. I'm from Cincinnati, so it's Joe Burrow, but it, you name your quarterback. Everybody knows the quarterback, number nine, number seven, number six. Number, everybody knows, but I would ask you on your favorite football team, if you watch football, who's number 75? Who's number 72? Nobody knows the offensive line of that football team. That is what public health is. But the metaphor breaks down because in football, when the quarterback wins the Super Bowl or when a game has been successful, they haven't had the sacks, the quarterback, the healthcare system, or fill in the blank, what happens is we oftentimes say we're going to continue to invest in that offensive line. But in public health, the moment tuberculosis rates go down, the moment the COVID crisis starts to be in our rearview mirror, we recede that investment in the offensive line. So the way we fight this investment, this challenge of invisibility that we have is that we have to raise our visibility, which shows value. When there's value, there's validation, the three Vs. But we never thought the fourth V of virus would bring public health in such a limelight. And yet I would argue it's a caricature of what public health truly is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Greenwood. Philadelphia Eagle Center's Jason Kelsey. He's really good. Uh, in the Super Bowl. Um, two questions. I've heard, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> two questions um, I'd ask each of you to respond to. Um, first has to do with the CDC. Um, uh, Congressman Upton referenced the fact that uh, Congresswoman McMorris Rogers 
from your state um, has uh, chairs the Energy and Commerce Committee now, and she has announced that she wants to uh, look into um, authorize the CDC. Uh, and they've had already, we just learned this morning, a, uh, a uh, oversight investigation uh, subcommittee meeting. So my question for each of you is, um, thinking about the CDC and your interactions with it, or, or in general during the pandemic, if you were among those who were going to have the opportunity to reform the CDC, you know, what would you do? What, where did you think in that they performed well in the pandemic and where do you think they came up lacking? Thank you for that question, uh, Representative Greenwood. I, I think that um, it aligns to, uh, again, what has been stated as far as some of the key pillars of the Moving Forward initiative. Uh, we, we had opportunities at Trust for America's Health to be in listening sessions and provide feedback into the agency uh, with regards to uh, opportunities for improvement as well as what has been working well. As I've noted, we've worked with the agency over many, many years. I, I think continuing to enhance and strengthening uh, its engagement and partnerships at all levels. Uh, Dr. Shaw um, has also spoken to this uh, matter um, as it relates to the development of guidances, the communications that we're putting out uh, and sharing with the community how we're doing so in a coordinated fashion to support uh, the efforts of really um, evidence-based public health guidance is critically important. The timeliness, we know that that's a challenge, especially with a novel virus that's rapidly evolving. How are we communicating and being able to share information in a timely way to be able to communicate that information effectively. And then also uh, prioritizing and centering equity. And I think a key and, and important step of the agency was in, in designating and creating the chief health equity officer position because we saw the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 was having on specific communities. Uh, and that's happened in past public health emergencies. And so making that committed investment as well to centering equity in the resources, in the communications, in the workforce that's also helping to serve communities is critically important. I didn't now, hear you say whether they were doing that well or they should do it better. I think that I think that there are areas where they were doing well and areas where there's opportunities for improvement. I think that's the case across our public health system. Uh, part of that is assuring that there are resources to be able to do that and that there's a workforce to be able to do that. And that exists at all levels. Uh, and then assuring that there are authorities to be able to, whether it's have the data that's necessary to be able to, to do the response as needed, to modernize the systems. We've been speaking to modernization at the state and local level with regards to data. That data modernization is also needed at the federal level as well. And that interoperability and strengthening the interoperability is also needed at the federal level. And so making those key investments and sustaining those investments will be important. Thank you very much. Dr. Shaw. Thank you so much for that question. You know, I would say there are a few things that we have lived uh, over the last few years. One is this real challenge about having the experience from what's happening in the field. And so this bi-directional communication is so critical, but it has to be timely. When, when we as, as state and even really truly at the local level, this is where I put on that local hat from, from previous, when we were finding out the announcements or pronouncements of what was about to happen on social media or on a press release and not finding out behind the scenes in advance, that was troublesome. Not only was it troublesome, it was dangerous because then I, as a public health official, could not provide context to a decision or a pivot of a decision all I was left doing was saying, well, I'm not certain, but there must have been a reason, and the public sees all of that play out. And this is the biggest challenge, is that we have to be markedly better on the coordination and communication within the tent of the public system, but we also have to remember that it's about science, but it's also about art. And what I mean by that is that there is a science to medicine, there's also an art to medicine. We need, we know what, blood pressure medicine works in the books, but you also have a patient where that blood pressure medicine didn't quite work the same, so we, through what we believe is the art of medicine, we make pivots and changes all the time, and patients and those who are using consumers of the healthcare system, they appreciate that and say, my doc was a good doc. He didn't go by the book, he went with what was the art of medicine. He or she knows me, knows what's best for me. It wasn't all textbook. I would argue there is also not just a science to public health, there is an art 
to public health. We need to know when we do certain things, when we don't do certain things, and we have to be markedly better at telling the story. So my counsel and advice to my colleagues at the CDC is, yes, start with science, but you have to be markedly better at communicating and if we do not engage and we do not let people know that we are one and of the community, that it's not about our white co coats or our stethoscopes or just the science, then we have lost the battle before it's even started. That is a biggest, my biggest concern is do we have the tools and the trainings and the people to be able to engage, communicate in ways that's gonna allow that science to live in the lives of everyday Americans. I am not 100% certain we're ready to do that. Thank you. It's interesting you both focused on communication. Thank you. Uh, one more question, if I may. Um, uh, sure. And that goes to, um, you, you both referenced the need for more investment in public health. We hear that a lot. Um, I think, uh, Dr. Gracia, you mentioned a 20% cut that in real uh, adjusted for inflation is 50% reduction, a two-thirds reduction. Um, it's pretty, the signals are pretty clear from the House Republicans that there's not going to, there's a, much more of an of a, of a inclination to reduce um, spending this year for, um, uh, for social programs in general um, than to increase them. So my question is, um, I assuming that that ends up to be the case, that you're, you're not going to see a big infusion of, of new federal dollars, you think that the states and localities are prepared to step up? And that may be a, a, a poignant question for you, sir, but um, for both of you, do you think that the, the um, I mean, to what extent is this really, you know, have to be, does the public health system have to depend on federal dollars as opposed to state and local tribal dollars? Well, I, I think it definitely puts a lot more pressure on the ability to be able to do those things. So the, 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 the field is reeling right now from the pandemic and from the work that, that has been done. On top of that, then you reduce the funding. And so our competition oftentimes isn't just other public sector agencies, it is private sector. And so when you have an epidemiologist who you think is fantastic, that epidemiologist gets a 20% salary bump to go to the healthcare system to become an infection control practitioner, and all of a sudden that hospital grabs your epidemiologist, you are left holding the bag. And that institutional knowledge and wisdom goes right out the door. That's the biggest challenge. I am very concerned about that. The number one issue in public health right now is our workforce. The number one issue is our workforce. We do not support and invest in our workforce. All of these technologies, all these other activities are gonna go by the wayside because you just won't have the people to be able to do the job. And so we've got to be smart on how we approach this. And we have a workforce that's also, as we've both mentioned, vilified and has had trauma from this, this responsibility, but also for people pointing fingers at that very workforce that was underinvested in over the decades. And now we come back and say, stay in the field. And they're not. They have other choices. That's the biggest challenge that I have. So I am concerned about the, the investment because we're going back to the same cycles. The emergency starts to subside, we ask questions, and absolutely the dollars go back. But the last thing is accountability, return on investment, value. Public health is an incredible value, but we just don't value what public health brings to the table. Until we start doing that and investing in that offensive line, we're gonna to continue to invest in the quarterback. And, and, and governors like the Congress have competing interests, but the governor's probably gonna to have to stand up and fill it, that void. Dr. Garcia. Representative Green, just quickly, I, was, I would add, and, and you started to allude to that with regards to the role of governors, is understanding that oftentimes it's public health that is the one giving the message, and, and really this is more than the public health sector advocating for public health. That This is really a responsibility of all of us and a, and a larger whole of society to understand how this impacts other sectors. We saw that the examples Dr. Shaw was giving, the private sector's engagements in the response. It's the, it's the business sector. It's philanthropy. It's recognizing education, transportation, but policymakers, elected officials, have such a keen role to play in understanding that it's not solely the public health sector's role. When we talk about, for example, policies such as paid sick leave, to, that, that that's a policy that we need in order to be able to control outbreaks and epidemics. But we see, for example, that we don't have those types of universal policies, the social and economic policies that can actually help support this in addition to the funding for infrastructure. So really being able to assure that it's not public health alone 
that is defending public health, but that others also see their role in defending and promoting public health. Thank you very much. Let me thank our two extraordinary colleagues um, for excellent. I didn't get a chance to ask my 10 questions, but <laughs> since, my, since my other interest is higher education and there's been an attack on liberal arts, I wanna point out that Dr. Gracia majored in French and Dr. Shaw majored in philosophy yeah. as undergraduates. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I join in a thank you. I just want to add this word and with thanks for focusing us on the uh, public health workforce. And it's particularly appropriate in this uh, venue. The Partnership for Public Service was started to really um, well, elevate and support uh, the civil service, public employees, often unsung. They uh, hold a dinner every year and recognize, uh, oh, about a dozen public servants, really unsung heroes. I must say, if I mention my friend uh, Sam Heyman, who endowed this organization, they call the awards Sammies, <laughs> like Oscars or Emmys. Uh, but these are really the, the people who make it happen. And I'm not going to forget your uh, metaphor of the, or was it an analogy, <laughs> of the offensive line, <laughs> because uh, <clears throat> we need you. Uh, you you've been uh, two really great witnesses. Not all our, our witnesses are receive applause at the end. So. Uh. Technologies applied to uh, the bio, um, bio defense responsibility of our country. Uh, part of it is uh, about the National Wastewater uh, surveillance system, uh, uh, which we have talked about already a little this morning. Part of it is about the way in which uh, machine learning uh, can uh, help us predict occurrences of uh, COVID-19, they did, or, or other um, diseases that threaten us. And part of, us, part of this is just a general modernization of data uh, collection and probably a lot of other things that I could only imagine. I probably couldn't imagine because I don't know enough. But anyway, uh, the first um, witness is, is Dr. Terry Bernard, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Kiagen, Q-I-A-G-E-N, which is one of two digital PCR platforms chosen to be used in uh, the so-called NWSS, National Wastewater Surveillance System, with really remarkable uh, success so far. So, uh, Dr. Bernard, I welcome you, and we look forward to your testimony now. Thank you so much. This one? Thank you so much, Senator Lieberman. Thanks also. Uh, uh, to this bipartisan commission uh, for this invitation. Uh, I would start apologizing for uh, my deep, thick accent. As you can understand, I was not born in this country, but uh, even if I took the American citizenship, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud also to testify in front of, um, of this commission. Um, seven minutes around wastewater and also what we consider to be urgent for the future, which is preparation and surveillance in case of a potentially new pandemic. Um, as we all know, and uh, I will refer uh, you all to an article that was published yesterday again in the New York Times and signed by uh, Bill Gates, uh, the title being, uh, I'm worried we are making the same mistake again, uh, which is really nailing uh, uh, what we are going to discuss today. We all know that the uh, pandemic did not, did not come by surprise. I mean, it, there is, I think, uh, no intelligence agency in the world here in the U.S., but in Europe that had no, uh, that had not any um, uh, scenario where a pandemic uh, would happen. Yet, as we all know as well, we were very slow to react. Uh, and uh, I think that we were not prepared. And this is what we are trying now to, uh, um, to um, uh, change. Um, I think this pandemic has proven two things, among other things. First of all, it's the critical value of diagnostic in the healthcare value chain, 
and the second also the critical value of innovation, especially molecular innovation in the diagnostic value chain. I think we have talked a lot about progresses made in vaccines, and that was obviously extremely welcome, but we tend to forget that the entire diagnostic industry had to really step up to the challenges of COVID-19 in a record time where we have seen uh, um, output capacity innovation multiplied by tens or sometimes much more to try to obviously uh, uh, answer this, um, this um, uh, pandemic. Everybody is familiar now with testing. Everybody knows what PCR means. Everybody knows what antigen means. I believe where we are lacking focus at the moment is on the overall surveillance. Uh, because this is what matters now that we are coming into, a, let's say, a more quiet period uh, uh, in terms of, of COVID-19. And, and part of surveillance, obviously, is not only the next generation sequencing variant monitoring, I'll come back on that, but uh, wastewater testing uh, 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 technologies. Um, I think you are all familiar, or I hope uh, you are all familiar with wastewater testing. This is nothing new. Uh, it has been used, uh, um, for example, uh, against polio uh, um, for many years uh, at the end of the, of the Second World War in many countries. Um, what is pretty interesting is that we have different technologies to deal with wet water testing, PCR, classical PCR, cell culture, quantitative PCR. But uh, um, those technologies up to now uh, um, uh, potentially could miss uh, rare or low abundant targets. Uh, and this is what is key with this technology. This technology allows the detection uh, several days before any clinical symptom in a very tiny amount of uh, uh, samples, obviously. Um, it really fills a, a significant surveillance gap. Uh, um, and this is why we have very uh, um, early tried to partner with the public health labs in the US and also with the CDC to try to deploy that new technology, digital PCR, uh, for wastewater testing. Um, um, around three axes or three priorities, I would say. Preparedness, surveillance, and as we will uh, talk after, I think, data agility. Uh, preparedness. Wastewater testing, especially with digital PCR, is a leading indicator system for early infection with ability to monitor very large population. Surveillance. We are going now to continue to work with uh, US authorities to try to expand that technology to other pathogens. I'll come back to that. And last but not least, all this would be useless without robust robust data platform, the ability to bring data together. There is a network in the US called Decipher that we propose to extend in our proposal uh, to the CDC. What could be the actionable next steps uh, uh, very quickly? First, preemptive. Everybody is talking about uh, COVID-19, but wastewater testing could be implemented for other pathogens. And I think it would be welcome in a country like the US, but also at the worldwide level, to predetermine a list of pathogens of interest where we could already implement technologies uh, like wastewater testing. Second is expanding that capacity to make sure that we cover the entire territory. At the moment, it's mostly around the public health labs. One of our proposals is to extend it and train other laboratories to ensure a full coverage, obviously, of the US. And last but not least is data collection. Decipher is an interesting network, yet it's limited to one organization in the US at the moment and not open, especially not open, to aggregation of data coming from the private sector. We would welcome that. Um, there is a preparedness and surveillance effort in the US, clearly. Yet, it's working in silo. I don't want to be offensive, but it's too much working in silo. You have mentioned, Senator, news around wastewater testing. We know also about LRN network. We know also the BioWatch. But just a quick example, and we can come back to that. The BioWatch has a list of priority pathogen to focus on. It's not the same list than news, for example, network. So it's two different lists, clearly. Uh, uh, we are not saying that there is no action or nothing done, but it's too much in silo. 
and we can come back to that. Uh, just have 20 seconds to conclude. Uh, I will try to go uh, uh, faster. I would conclude with three call for action. During the pandemic, there has been an exceptional partnership between private and public, between industry for diagnostic therapeutics and the CDC, the Department of Defense, HSS. This partnership now is really becoming just a reporting collaboration. There is no significant collaboration around genomic testing of, for example, positive PCR to detect variants of potential pathogens. There is no real extended investment or discussion around the extension of wastewater testing. Second, there is no, in a quiet period like now, efforts and concertation to try to plan in advance. Our choice is very simple. What do we want for the future? Continue to rely on luck if such a situation happens again or plan it. This is now when it's quiet that we, would, we should focus on some pathogen of priorities, train, organize where we would organize the testing and plan for the scale up of our testing capacity. I remind you, it took us six to seven months to be able to supply just the market needs for the United States uh, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And last but not least, and I would like to alert the commission on something which is, in my view, uh, not mentioned enough, all these come to supply chain as well. I am extremely concerned at the moment with the dependency of the overall medtech pharmaceutical and diagnostic industry on supplies from Asia Pacific and especially from China and Taiwan. And that has significant consequences in the ability to supply instruments, obviously, to scale up our response capacity. I will stop here. I'm sorry, I, I went a bit over the seven minutes, but open to the discussion, obviously. Uh, not at all. I could have listened longer. What, what are the elements, uh, just quickly, of the supply chain on which we're dependent on uh, Asia Pacific that worry you? I think uh, uh, currently, and I'm not talking about our company, I think uh, I'm talking about the diagnostic and the med tech in general. I think there is a reliance of uh, component, critical components such as obviously microconductor, lead board for system. You know, for example, in diagnostic, you use chemical to have reagents, but you use also more and more system to read the results. And this is critically depending on supply from Taiwan, China. Another example, because we were extremely taken by surprise during the pandemic, and again, it's not a criticism, uh, and because there was not enough proactive preparation, we have been approving in this country, like anywhere else in Europe, dubious from a quality standpoint, Chinese tests, for example, antigen anti tests especially. There is no foreign test approved in China for COVID. Okay. There is no foreign vaccines approved in China for COVID. There is a clear unbalanced situation from a response standpoint between what is happening and the threat on Taiwan or the threat, the geopolitical threat in this region and our dependence uh, from this region as well. Thanks, Mr. Bernard. That was great. Uh, Dr. Mauricio Santillana is a uh, professor at Northeastern University, also on the affiliate uh, faculty at the uh, Harvard Chin uh, School of uh, Public Health done some really uh, remarkable work, which uh, we look forward to hearing about now. Thanks for being here. Thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to participate and offer my opinions and views on the use of novel data sources as a way to monitor disease outbreaks and, of course, the use of machine learning now a standard in almost every other industry, but not in public health. Um, and I think this is opening um, us to an opportunity that should be taken um, immediately, and we have shown how. So I'm here representing uh, the academic sector. I'm a researcher, um, and um, so I would, I would like to um, walk you through the process um, <clears throat> that we have followed in terms of using these novel data sources as thermometers or social uh, sensors of what's happening in our communities. Uh, when we navigate the internet using our mobile phones or computers, we leave something we call digital traces. In other words, they are um, sometimes in your browsers, they're, they're called cookies. Uh, the, your phone or computer remembers what you search for. 
Um, and as such, uh, companies like Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Google, they target ads to you that are specifically um, addressed to fulfill your needs or what they think are your needs. Um, we aspire to be as productive and operational as those companies uh, in using that same information, but with, diff with a different purpose, which is to make sure our societies are safe. Um, we have shown over the years that these technologies and these data sources combined with machine learning can be used to anticipate uh, when a public health threat is about to come. For example, when people are concerned about an outbreak, they start searching what are the symptoms of COVID-19, for example, or what are the symptoms of uh, mpox, previously known as monkeypox. Um, and as such, we start seeing this uh, awareness uh, permeating our societies. And eventually, when they get sick, they start searching, for example, what are the uh, remedies against uh, respiratory disease, or they start, they start tweeting, um, I'm not going to work because this disease is killing me. I have a fever. Um, and at the same time, clinicians start searching in, on their desks uh, for dosing information for different medications. So all these alternative data sources that are currently available, and many, if not most of them, are proprietary to companies, um, when they have shared that, that information with us, that means when they share the trends over time, we can see that when many of them simultaneously uh, increase in uh, occurrence, for example, more um, clinicians searching for the word Tamiflu, which is an antiviral to treat influenza, or you know, for COVID test, uh, searches on COVID test or COVID, COVID testing, um, we see what, that in synchrony when all of them uh, show up um, that they are increasing over time. Uh, eventually, we see the manifestation of that in terms of increases in hospital visits weeks after these early signals are available. In other words, we advocate in favor of using this data that's already uh, collected, again, owned by private companies, uh, to be open to the research community and the public health network that we live in. Um, so COVID-19 presented us with a great opportunity because many of these companies were open to sharing this data. But as uh, uh, Thierry was sh sharing with us, um, this interest has faded, and now we don't see this sharing. They closed their um, data feeds to us, and even though we advocate in favor of using peacetime to continue learning and implementing and operationalizing for the next event, what ends up happening is that we wait until uh, the next threat is upon us and then we start relearning and we fail to make use of these uh, data and technologies as a um, way to prepare against the next um, bio threat. Um, so, um, we have uh, uh, had a lot of success partnering with uh, agencies like the CDC the, um, and many international uh, health organizations uh, like the European CDC, Africa CDC. I work very closely with local health officials and mayors in the Boston area. And in fact, one of the success stories we had was that early in the pandemic, when testing was not going well because the COVID tests were not um, functioning as expected, uh, we could see in all these alternative uh, signals the emergence of, of the outbreak. And as such, we recommended to the Boston mayors to uh, have a stay-at-home um, um, order as a way to not um, overwhelm our, our healthcare system, flattening the curve that was our, our Moto. That was the only tool that we had given the, all the unknowns we had against COVID. But that's an example of one time when, because we had done this for influenza, dengue fever, yellow fever, and many other uh, diseases around the world, we could provide guidance to an actionable uh, committee that uh, hurt us and that led to, you know, um, um, a least um, bad scenario, if that makes sense. Um, and so what I recommend 
for this commission is an effort to um, set up a process that could open up this data sharing as a social responsibility of these companies that we all empowered by giving our data uh, for free. We are the product of these companies. That's, we, we all know that, we all assume it, we all click accept, accept, accept anytime we download an app. So it would be great if we had some reciprocity from these companies in moments of crisis and during peace times so that we could implement and operationalize all these methods that leverage these novel data sources that were not originally designed to monitor disease outbreaks but that have shown over time that are useful um, for us to contextualize what's happening uh, in our communities. I'll stop there. That's great. So am I understanding correctly that you're suggesting there ought to be a law to require the sharing of this data from the companies that collect it? I think so. I think that, that, would, that would be a, a good way to, currently the way we work with them is we need to go through uh, signing multiple non-disclosure right. agreements. And that takes time and the crisis, you know, it, we know that if we miss days or weeks at the beginning signing up things, people are dying. And, yeah. you know, if we could iron out that process, um, and of course in collaboration with agencies like the CDC and the Center for Forecasting and um, Outbreak Analytics, um, it would be great to have a continuous feed of this data so that people continue monitoring and learning how to implement these machine learning based uh, methods. So, uh, here's a uh question from a non-scientist. How do you make this work? In other words, is this an algorithm? Yes. And then how do you, what do you, do you apply it to a defined geographic area or can you do it to the we, whole country? We've, we've shown that this, it's possible to deploy these algorithms in multiple countries, multiple diseases, multiple spatial resolution. That means that if we were interested in monitor what's ha monitoring what's happening in Washington, D.C., we would need, the, of course, the cooperation of all these companies that are uh, collecting this information. And then we look at the trends over time. Um, and we know that different regions in the world have different habits, different cultures. And, and that's where machine learning emerges, because we need to learn the specifics of each community and what they respond to, what they search for, um, how they move or commute from uh, their houses to their jobs, et cetera. So we basically build systems that can learn from each community and as such become uh, useful and effective half after learning um, the, the way it has to be done in each different spatial resolution and, and region. Very exciting. Uh, Dr. Layden, uh, thanks for, so much for being here. Thanks for the extent to which you've helped make <laughs> these two uh, previous stories. Possible Dr. Layden is the Acting Director for Public Health Science and Surveillance at the uh, CDC. Glad to have you here. Great. Thank you. Senator Lieberman, distinguished members of the, of the Commission, thank you and good afternoon. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. My name is Jen Layden and I serve as the Acting Director of the new Office for Public Health Data, Surveillance and Technology at CDC. Prior to joining CDC two and a half years ago, I worked at the state uh, level as the Chief Medical Officer for Illinois Department of Public Health and as Deputy Commissioner for Chicago Department of Public Health. So I've been experienced uh, the challenges we face across public health at the state, city, and now federal level. I think we can all uh, recognize the challenges uh, in, during the COVID pandemic and MPOC's response, and it has highlighted the uh, brittled, uh, outdated systems that we have across public health. Our systems are, are antiquated. They're not leveraging the modern technology, the modern analytic tools that were, were mentioned earlier. They're not interoperable with our healthcare partners. So it, it makes the data exchange across public health and with our healthcare systems very challenging. It makes it very manual. In 2020, there was uh, the, the dedication of resources to support the DMI initiative at CDC and across public health. Um, and that has certainly helped. We've seen advances in wastewater, We've seen improvements in electronic case reporting, which is reducing the burden on the data senders at the healthcare level, as well as the burden at the jurisdictional level. 
uh, but there's still significant progress and significant work that needs to be done. Uh, there, how outdated the systems are, and not just the technology, but addressing some of the policy, the administrative, the analytic capabilities, the workforce capabilities, is going to be a long initiative, a long effort across public health, and leveraging important partnerships, including with our private partners. As part of the Moving Forward initiative, Dr. Walensky laid out a path uh, for CDC to undergo some important uh, changes. One of those was to establish the Office of Public Health Data Surveillance and Technology. This is the first time that we have an office dedicated to a public health data strategy. And importantly, it brings together not just the data, but the technology and the components of surveillance. and addresses not just the, those aspects, but also policy and administrative barriers we need to to address to ensure our systems, our processes, our policies across public health um, are all taken into account as we modernize our approaches and our systems. One function of this office is to establish a public health data strategy that helps to set a strategic path, not just for CDC, but with our partners. Uh, in the first iteration of that, we've laid out four major goals uh, with specific milestones for the next two years, recognizing this is a long-term process and long-term uh, strategy, but there's some short-term immediate things that we need to address. Laying out those four goals at a high level, the first is to ensure that our core data sources um, undergo iterative progress so that the data is exchanged more rapidly across our systems. It's more accessible to those that need access to it, and that's not just within public health, but it's to others that leverage the data, and to ensure that the data is more complete. We've recognized and have seen the challenges of our case data and our lab data having incomplete data, for example, on race and ethnicity, um, or other data taking days to months to make it to uh, another public health partner so that we can leverage it and understand the disease burden. Importantly, uh, in the next two years, we want to and see the importance of focusing on case and lab data. These are disease agnostic data exchange mechanisms um, that need to undergo modernization, not just in the technology that we leverage across public health, but also in leveraging analytic capabilities, machine learning, and addressing some of the policy gaps that we have that limit the exchange and sharing of the data. The second goal is about developing and uh, making available enterprise-wide solutions, meaning solutions that are available across public health. Much of the work that happens in public health happens at the state and local level. They're investigating a case, they're identifying a case, they're responding to an outbreak. We need to, sure that we need to ensure that we develop tools and solutions that support their needs. One example of that is the, the, what we call the case surveillance system. This is something the CDC hosts and is used by over 20, I guess 27 jurisdictions. There's uh, a significant need to modernize to ensure that it can integrate data across multiple streams, case, lab data, vital statistic data, and it develops tools and solutions to enable them to no longer have to do manual data entry, but to make that more automated and reduce the burden on them. The third big goal is around ensuring we are doing a better job of getting data out there, getting data out so others can use it, not just within public health, but the public, uh, governmental officials, others that rely on that data and information to inform decision making. The fourth uh, data is around ensuring our systems are more interoperable. Our systems right now are very siloed. Um, they don't always speak to each other across public health, but also importantly with our healthcare partners. So if a healthcare entity sends data, um, the systems and, and their basic standards of how they define certain data elements or how they receive data don't always match. And so that makes it a very manual process um, and it takes time away from people to do their, their, uh, their job. So focusing on making our systems more interoperable so the data can automatically flow um, but also ensuring that we uh, intentionally focus on open data, making data available, uh, not just across public health, but again, to those that rely on it uh, and can use it to gain insights uh, to either detect, monitor, or respond to a, a public health threat. To meet these goals uh, across public health and with our public health partners, it will rely on uh, working closely with private partners, our healthcare partners, and many others. Um, two important recommendation, uh, recommendations that I want to highlight uh, that I think are important as we move forward with these goals is one around data authority. We've talked about some of the challenges around data sharing. At the federal level, uh, we have limited authority. We have no authority to uh, require the, the sending of the data to the, the federal level. 
or to help kind of coordinate and establish basic standards across our systems. During the COVID pandemic, we did, uh, uh, we, we did have some authority under the public health emergency, and we saw the increase in the, the improvement in the quality of the data, for example, the lab data and the hospital uh, capacity data uh, that we could then have a better national situational awareness um, of the public health threat. Having that basic authority would help to establish some basic standards and help with the coordination across public health. And then the second is sustained funding. Uh, there's been significant investments made over the last several years. They um, uh, uh, are not to the level of what many estimates say would be needed to modernize the public health system. That sustained uh, f commitment to funding that is leveraged not just at the federal level, then, but also to support the work that happens at the state and local level is needed to ensure that our systems are response ready. Uh, they're leveraging the modernized technology, the analytic capabilities, uh, so that our systems and our public health system is prepared uh, and working closely with healthcare partners and others uh, in the healthcare sector. Um, again, it's a privilege, privilege to be here. Uh, thank you and, and happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Dr. Layden. Let me just ask you a quick sort of factual question. Am I right that uh, your office um, ha received money through some of the post-COVID uh, legislation that was adopted and, and that's enabled you to be supportive of the uh, technologies and applications that you've talked about? Yes, there's been several sources. So there's a what I'd call a DMI base funding that started in 2020. Right. And there's been care, uh, funding from the COVID pandemic through CARES and ARP that's been uh, helping to support, but that will go away uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah, so that, that'll be, uh, I, I assume you think it shouldn't go away. In other words, the job is not done. <laughs> the job is not done. It'll right. take several years. Uh, to modernize our systems, yeah. and it's not just the technology, but the workforce um, in many other aspects. So am I right that you, uh, uh, to be direct because they're here, that you have, CDC has uh, worked in partnership with Mr. Bernard and his company and Dr. Saniana and uh, his, so, their work? Yeah, so d myself directly, I've not worked, uh, had the pleasure or opportunity to work, but they mentioned Decipher. Decipher is a great system. It's a common operating picture that pulls in data and helps many systems um, uh, respond to outbreaks. For example, foodborne outbreaks, yeah. the wastewater example. Um, so it talked about CFA, their partnership with CFA. So there have been uh, extended partnerships. And those, are, those were uh, part of CDC or, yes. yeah. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's great. So I have a, a question somewhat to the side of the, uh, about an application of the exciting uh, uh, the technologies application you've described. Uh, uh, our commission has um, a, at least a two-pronged uh, set of missions by our founding documents, and one is obviously how to deal with naturally occurring uh, pandemics. The other is um, how to deal with um, uh, bioweapons terrorism. So, um, and and there you got a case different, as you better know better than I, when if there's a, a bioweapons attack, how, how do you uh, find out that that's what's happening and find out quickly enough to uh, apply uh, medical countermeasures? So do, do either of the really exciting uh, technologies and applications that you've talked about um, apply to that as well? I would say yes, I think, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Senator. Um, um, for me, the, uh, the biodefense or the bio threat must be including in that list of, let's say, 30 or 40 pathogens uh -huh. of known interest, whether it is anthrax, once again, or one. And this is where I think, especially in those, I don't know if we can qualify this period of time as quiet, but from a pandemic standpoint where basically there is no... Uh, 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 pressure coming from something like COVID, we should really first establish that list of priority pathogens. Second, establish the way to scale up our answer in advance, not under pressure against. The question is whether we want to rely on luck or we want to plan, that, plan it in advance. If we have that list of potential pathogens, modern technologies, whether it is wastewater, next generation sequencing, or PCR, 
could detect them very quickly. You have companies that are very much supported by Barda, for example, developing very quick solution against anthrax. Uh, 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 one of them is T2 Biosystem, for example, in, in Boston. So the technology is here to answer clearly. It's, to me, the ability to scale up quickly, answer very quickly, train people, and make sure that the answers are deployed in a significant numbers of laboratory and testing capabilities all over the territories, and not just some specialized laboratories. Because this has shown its limit when obviously uh, the numbers of contaminating people becomes quite impossible to, uh, to, to control, so. Okay, that's great. If, if I may add. Um, Please. Uh, to me, uh, for example, during COVID-19, uh, Google was um, very proactive in sharing with us researchers and the general public the trends of different um, symptoms that could be caused by any disease, fever, stomach ache, um, thing, you, you name it, right, like headache. And so <clears throat> for us, if we have a system that's continuous, think of uh, monitoring the vital signs of a person, <clears throat> right? But in this case, it would be the vital signs of a city or a country, right? So if we're closely monitoring those changes um, to answer your question, yeah. in principle, if it's a disease that causes um, known symptoms, uh, then in principle, we could detect yeah. that there's an anomaly. Uh, and we're not doing it. And it's so such a low-hanging fruit that you know these tech companies have done for decades already. And we, the public, um, and uh, citizens, we are not benefiting from that. And I think it's just a great opportunity. So I appreciate the answers. Our commission has done work on this question. And uh, to put, just say it in uh, one sentence, the existing uh, surveillance systems uh, to detect a bioweapons terrorist attack are really totally uh, inadequate. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm heartened that you think the, uh, the work that you're doing uh, may be applicable to that, and, and my guess is would help us a lot uh, more than what, what exists now. I, I'm going to stop there and ask Secretary Shalala if she has questions. Yeah, I, I want to ask a quick question. Um, Dr. Layton, um, it sounds like you've got the goals right, but you don't have the authority. Um, the authority to mandate the states, they all collect data in different ways though they do report to the CDC um, a lot of the data, and during the crisis, they re at least the hospitals uh, reported. What would happen, how long would it take you if you had the authority and the resources to put a national data system in place given the new technology? So maybe just to add to that a little bit on the, the authorities, right? The, so there are data usage agreements we use for some of our systems. Um, but the challenge there is that that is with every jurisdiction, so 64 plus jurisdictions, depending on how the state's set up, as well as for every single data system, so case data, lab data, syndromic surveillance. I think a good example, just based on the conversation around kind of the, the symptom detection, is there's a system called syndromic surveillance. It monitors ED visits um, to the hospitals. Over almost 80% of hospitals now nationwide are sending that data. We at the federal level, though, do not have the authority to look at it. We only can look at it regionally um, uh, outside of a public health emergency. That system almost sends near real time, 20, uh, within 24 hours, ED symptoms that you could leverage uh, analytic capabilities and other technologies to be looking at that more real time for some of these trends or, or changing shifts. So there are systems uh, that with advances in technology and automated solutions, um, could do some of the, the, the things that are, are, are possible now. Um, the, you know, one of the challenges is to do that broadly across uh, in a way that doesn't put too much burden on our healthcare partners, and that's where the authority plays out. So if we have every jurisdiction asking each hospital for data in different ways, that's too much burden. So there needs to be a way to standardize that. Um, as to how long that would take, to, that a big part of that is the scope of the resources as well as really getting direct uh, support from private industries and others to accelerate that work. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. If I may, to this, uh, to this point, I think uh, more than how long it will take, it will probably take shorter than with no preparation in any case. And we have the technologies and we have the uh, different uh, um, also agencies. Uh, what is important is to define, once again, in quiet period, the real protocols to see how are we going to be able to act quicker. The list of pathogens, we, I mean, coronavirus, for example, was nothing new from a biology standpoint. We have all dealt with coronavirus. This one was a bit specific, but the list of pathogens is, is, rather, uh, is rather known. We have sent a proposal to the CDC of more than 30 pathogens because we know that those are the main, basically, uh, uh, frequently at stake. What I think is to organize the scenario for the best and quickest answer, and this needs to be protocoled. And to your point, it needs to include, obviously, who is calling the shot at what moment. There was a time during COVID that no fans, there was a real contradiction and even sometime uh, 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 opposition of efforts between what was mandated by the federal states and then by the states themselves. And, and that was obviously detrimental to the quality of the answer overall. Are there other countries that have put the system in place? France, for example? So it's a very interesting question because, um, uh, once again, in every country, I think, even if it was a bit later at the point, this pandemic has proven that there is no escape from a very strong public-private partnership. And you could clearly see the different national mindset in the answers. The French, it was very quick. It said, from the government, from the office of President Macron, what do you have? What kind of solution? I buy it all. You see, extremely organized and trying to split the market between the different players, whether they were French or not. Sometimes with the excess of the French system, sometimes, because when we ask them, do you mean that you want to deliver also to the labs? They said, yes, we will deliver. And that after a couple of weeks, they understood that they did not know, obviously, supply, and it was creating more difficult situation. But the efficiency of basically having a common purchase program was extremely beneficial for everybody because it gave us visibility on needs. In the US, we lost a bit of time at a point between there was no organization of purchase. It was even impossible to speak about it, and I can understand that. And at the end, we were trying to satisfy everybody, which is also meaning frustrating everybody, because uh, we were trying to answer states, a representative of Congress, obviously HSS, and so on. Once again, it worked at a point but we could have planned that in advance. We know perfectly who are the relevant agencies. We know who are the relevant progresses from academia, from research. We know who are the relevant companies as well, therapeutic or testing. Uh, they have been on the market for many years. They are not born with a pandemic. We could have organized that a bit better. It's protocoling the answer that would make a difference, I think. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Congressman Upton, you're next. Well, thanks. And again, I apologize for not being there in person. I just have, I guess, the two questions that I have. One is, you know, we didn't really know about COVID before it hit. So it's pretty difficult to use wastewater or, or anything else to try and identify something that we don't necessarily know is there until it may be too late. So, I mean, people have symptoms, they have fever, they're tired, you know, all the different, you know, we had a little discussion earlier about advertising and it seems like every, every product that the pharma is advertises, it, it lists a whole bunch of different diseases that you can get, which is almost the universe. Um, but I guess the other question I have is this panel is important solving surveillance problems and modernizing data, but going back to, a, a, you know, as we try to connect the dots, is, have you all done any serious effort to actually look at what the, stock st what the stockpile might have that might be able to remedy uh, a, a new um, uh, pandemic uh, that we don't know anything about? I mean, what, what what is the communication like between the state and, and locals with what's actually in the stockpile, I guess is my question. So the, 
that we may need to uh, pull in Asper and other, other colleagues to help um, defer that question to them if it's okay. Okay. So I, I can take a shot at, at the first uh, part, which is when it's a pathogen of uh, uh, unknown origins. Uh, once again, I, I'm going to insist, I think uh, uh, biology and science currently know what kind of, of main pathogen can create problems, whether it's respiratory issues or it's respirat or gastro issues or bio threats sometimes can be a bit more complex, but as soon as we have access, for example, uh, to the strain of a, of a, of a specific pathogen, uh, artificially created or not, it's very easy to create a test. It's very easy. Uh, it doesn't take time. I'm not talking a regulated test, but that's not what it is about when we try to answer emergently. To your question, sir, we can perfectly, with wastewater and other technologies, PCR, digital PCR and others, create also tests addressing a syndrome. So you are not detecting just one pathogen. You are trying to detect in one sample 20 pathogens that are belonging to a syndrome, once again, respiratory, for example. And they can be viruses, they can be bacteria, they can be, yes. So technologies allows a certain flexibility. Uh, uh, and again, when we are faced with an emergency answer and we don't have to regulate a test submitted to the FDA, for example, in a co collaboration, for example, with the CDC, developing a test can be extremely quick. It's, it's a matter of weeks, clearly. And, and when I say weeks, it's one or two weeks. So, so the technology allows for that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Fred. And now to uh, your former colleague, Susan Brooks. Thank you. I have three very different questions. I'll start um, with you. And I am very proud to be from Carmel, Indiana, that has been using the wastewater treatment uh, detection system for years. And it really came to light during COVID. So it was uh, interesting. That's how I learned about it. Uh, from reading our paper and learning how it was being used. So that's been great. Um, I am concerned about your comment about the supply chain issue with China and Taiwan. And can you please uh, be a, a little more specific? What are the products? What are the, th not really specific products, what are the categories of products that we need to be concerned about with respect to our surveillance? I'll do that first, and I'm going to quick go to the next so you can just each going. Uh, Dr. Uh, San Santania, um, you talked about Google, Facebook, others closed off their data recently. I'd like you to explain what explanation they've given for that and what has been done to try to work around that. And then for you, Dr. Ling, um, having just finished work on Indiana's public health system, the issues around data uh, became far more controversial than I anticipated or really realized from citizens, then to state legislators, and so forth. And so what is CDC doing, or in your department maybe, to uh, combat the whole issue around people's concern of the big brother, the data security, their own personal medical information? They believe that the federal government is collecting that. And so what are you doing about that? And then lastly, in our local public health departments, I'm concerned we don't have enough people to even when you produce products with your data that anyone's reading them or doing anything with them. And so those are my questions. Uh, so, so many thanks for, uh, for your comments. Uh, by the way, uh, very quickly, we, when we talk about wastewater, we, we, we uh, think about public health lab and, uh, in different states. Uh, uh, COVID has proven as well that if you do wastewater testing just in planes, in flights, arriving in the US or in Europe, I mean, the recent examples when China stopped uh, their controls, testing, lockdown, and so on, testing flights from China, wastewater testing mm -hmm. from flights from China mm -hmm. to Europe showed a positive rate of more than 35%. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's something that we always have to remember. Now, um, uh, mm -hmm. to the uh, criticity of, of supply, um, I don't want to be alarmist, but uh, um, 
in critical components such as electronic lead board, microconductor, mm -hmm. which is basically conditioning the efficiency of the uh, 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 medical devices. Mm -hmm. In case of a serious threat, I think the ability to supply will be a year. In other words, we will have a year of capacity to supply the market worldwide. And I'm not just saying Kyogen, I'm saying overall. And I don't want to be alarmist because, of course, we will try to find alternatives, but it will be potentially too late. In terms of biologics, I don't think that there are many issues. We are quite okay, we are not too dependent. But I want to give you a very factual data. To develop a molecular test, uh, we need one component, some of you might know it, called guanidine. In a normal year, a company like ours, we use kilos of guanidine. When the pandemic started, we needed tons, tons of guanidine. You understand also that it's a spillover effect on the entire supply chain because our providers were not able to supply. But I think that on biologics, we are okay. Uh, the third component is the environment of a, of a product, which is plastics, for example. This was seriously under constraints. Uh, but if there is a call for action, it's on microconductor, electronic lead board, electronic components of a medical device. This is where the danger is coming from. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, to address your question, um, I've had multiple conversations with um, companies, for example, I'm thinking about one that shares, has shared with us in the past during health crisis data from what physicians are searching for. Um, their argument about stopping to share data is that we're no longer in a crisis and that that information is their IP and that's what they um, sell, and so they want to monetize. They say, well, now you showed that our data is useful, so now you should pay us, right? Whereas in many cases, what I feel is not well balanced is the fact that for certain companies where we, the citizens, are the product because we are the, they're selling our information, I, it feels a little bit uh, unbalanced in terms of their social responsibility. Um, so that's why I had that recommendation before. But yeah, the main argument is that it costs them money to gather and maintain a data pipe uh, directed to anyone who needs it, and that somebody has to pay for that, and they're not willing to do it. Um, so to the first question, uh, the patient privacy, data security, patient confidentiality are, are, are foremost uh, you know, primary principles that we, we are committed to in public health. At the federal level, rarely do we need identifiable information. That's needed at the local and state level. When they're identifying a case, they need to uh, uh, reach out to the case or their contacts in cases like of a measles exposure or something else. Um, working with our public health partners, we are working uh, a well, there's a common principle of minimal data necessary. What is that minimal data necessary we need to do, we need to have access to to do our job, to understand the national situation or whatnot? That level of data access is different, and we're working with our partners at the state and local level to define that so it's clear, but also we are ensuring the protection of patient privacy, confidentiality, and doing that securely. Uh, the, point, the question you bring up about local health uh, department, I think, is a really important one. Uh, having worked in Illinois, we had almost 90 health departments, local health departments, where oftentimes there would be one person who would be working, was the one person working for two local health departments. Uh, one approach that we are incorporated into our office is user design principles. So when we're talking about tools and solutions for the local and state, it may not be that they need want access to certain data. They want a tool or solution to make their job easier to investigate the case. So how they do that more auto automated to reduce their burden so that they can do other things. So when we're talking about the solutions and tools, it's really with the, the foremost of what is needed at that state and local level to support their ability to do those investigations and responses. Uh, Congressman Greenwood. So <clears throat> my question is for 
Dr. Santiano and Dr. Layden have already been asked, so, and we're over time. So I just have one question for you, Mr. Bernard. And, and it's really just to understand the technology a little bit better. So um, I assume that you can't, with this wastewater measurement technology, you can only find what you're looking for. So you, you have to sort of pre, you, you have to, you have to um, uh, adjust your system so that it's going to pick up the, the pathogen for which you're seeking, right? And so I just want to understand that, so all of a sudden somewhere in the world, uh, or here, um, including here, there is a, uh, somebody picks up that there's a pathogen out there. And, and now, so do you have to have the genetic sequence before you can look for it? And then assuming that you get the genetic sequence and you're looking for it, then how does that, and you also mentioned that the problem is that this, this technology is not applied nationwide, for instance. So in an ideal world, you know, could you just walk me through, us through, you know, find the path, somebody identifies the pathogen, somebody um, uh, t gets this genetic se sequence of the gene, um, and then it, it somehow gets applied to all this technology and all over the place. So how does that happen? Yeah. So, so many thanks for the question. So, yes, you're right. I mean, uh, when you are trying to detect something very precisely, once you know what it is, you need to have access to uh, um, that strain to develop the test, clearly. Uh, but as I said before, you have the ability because, once again, with a very high level of probability, we know also the kind of pathogens that could be of potential uh, 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 relevance in such a threat. So we could do that also for a multiple level uh, of pathogen, not just what we call monoplex, but multiplex. And technologies like PCR or digital PCR can allow that multiplexing. You are not just looking for one pathogen, but for uh, five, four, even 20, up to 48 with the technology that we know at the moment in, uh, in, uh, in PCR. I don't think that we need that numbers, but it gives you a... Um, um, and then I think uh, um, what's uh, um, important for me, I, I didn't say that it was not widely deployed. I think uh, it's, it's still deployed in very specialized laboratory, very efficient laboratory, especially the public health lab networks. I'm just thinking that especially in time where we have time to plan to protocol the answer, we should also determine other type of laboratories per states that would be entitled to get access to that technology very quickly. That doesn't mean that we need to deploy the technology immediately. They don't have the need to buy it, for example. But when something happens, then we should deploy it immediately. And we know in advance. Because if not, again, you rely on luck. Because everybody wants the solution, and it's not a coordinated answer. Does it answer your question? Or? It does. Thank, Thank you. you. You're back. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jim. Our uh, witness on the last panel is here, but I want to uh, thank the three of you. I'm just thinking, looking at you, you're a personification and realization of the uh, um, often described a goal of a private-public partnership in the public interest. Uh, what you're doing is really quite exciting, and um, um, I, I know that the work you've done both in wastewater surveillance and in applying your algorithm ha has been remarkably predictive. And it seems to me, um, to end on, a, on an optimistic note, which I think is justified, uh, we're just at the beginning of understanding uh, how to develop these, uh, the application of these um, new technologies to uh, protecting our public health. So I thank you not only for your testimony today, and thank you for helping facilitate all this, Dr. Lane. Uh, but also for what you do every day to keep us uh, healthier than we would otherwise be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Don O'Connell, the Asper. You know, to introduce somebody that way would only be appreciated in this room. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, as I said, uh, we're honored to have uh, Don O'Connell, uh, who is uh, the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, thanks very much for being with us. We look forward to your testimony now. 
Great, thank you. Thank you so much, commissioners, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about these issues with you. And I wanna share some of my concerns as we're emerging uh, from this once in a lifetime, we hope, pandemic, and some of my priorities as we're emerging from the pandemic. Good. And I intend just to offer a few opening remarks and then I'm looking forward to a discussion. Um, so at the beginning of the pandemic, you'll recall there was surprise and disappointment when we didn't have all of what the country expected us to have, whether that was PPE and the strategic national stockpile, domestic manufacturers for critical supplies, visibility into and the ability to influence the supply chain, surge staffing and logistics and operational horsepower to quickly procure and distribute countermeasures. With supplemental funds, we have been able to build systems and programs and purchase the things needed for this pandemic. These systems and programs resulted in the COVID vaccines and therapeutics program, the 1 billion free test from the US Postal Service, the over 80 projects we're investing in in domestic manufacturing, the supply chain control tower and other programs. How we maintain these programs and capabilities that we needed and we built and we used extensively in the pandemic and we'll need again with the next response and the next response but are currently only funded with COVID dollars, this is something that keeps me up at night. I've been able to take steps to help preserve some of the capabilities already. HCORE, which is the operations and logistical arm of Operation Warp Speed that we inherited from DOD last year was funded on our annual budget in FY23, which means the department now has access to the sophisticated logistics arm for any responses moving forward and we've become a standalone agency within HHS. Just like CDC, NIH, and FDA, ASPR is now in administration, which gives me flexibility to build the HR and acquisitions components I need to be more nimble and quick-footed in future responses. You'll recall we had to rely on DOD and FEMA for acquisitions and staffing support for this purpose. But there are still capabilities we need to preserve and work that needs to be done to ensure we are better situated for the next public health emergency or disaster. And while I was able to preserve HCORE's capability in the FY23 budget, Congress has yet to agree to preserve our supply chain work by giving it annual dollars. Our industrial base management and supply chain work, you'll recall, was born out of the initial supply chain pinches the country experienced in March 2020 when the whole world needed the exact same supplies at the exact same time and they were all manufactured somewhere else. With significant supplemental investments, we are building a program to ensure that we have PPE and critical supplies manufactured in the U.S. moving forward and that we have visibility into the supply chain for those needed supplies. But these efforts, because they are funded with COVID dollars, can only be focused on COVID-related supplies. And when those funds run out, that work will stop. It is important to have annual funds to sustain the work uh, we have started and to be able to expand this work to other parts of the public health supply chain. Just in the last few months, we have seen supply chain challenges and other medical products outside of COVID. Children's Tylenol, for example, this winter when we had the RSV and flu um, surges and infant formula last summer, just a few examples. It is important that we maintain the capabilities we have built and broaden them so we can apply them to prevent shortages or supply chain pinches in the next outbreak or disaster we face. Another thing that keeps me up at night is that we are losing time in preparing for the next pandemic. We were able to move out so quickly with countermeasures against COVID because so much work had already uh, been undertaken on coronaviruses due to prior outbreaks from SARS and MERS. We know the next seven viral families most likely to cause a pandemic. While we have time, it is important to get the same head start we had on the coronaviruses. We need funding to develop prototype vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics that we can put on the shelf and pull down when and should that virus hit. And we've asked for $20 billion in this year's budget to start that work. And then we need the ready resources to immediately scale up manufacture of those prototypes when we have the first indication of an outbreak. We have asked for an additional 400 million in flexible funding to allow us to move quickly against whatever comes next. And finally, the last thing that keeps me up at night is making sure that we have the funding needed to fully transition into this standalone agency. I mentioned that we have been designated an agency, now we have to become one. It would be management malpractice for us to look the same as we did three years ago. We've learned too much and grown too much in these last three years to ever go backwards. 
now that we've been designated an operating division, we need the funding to build these capabilities. And I've asked for an additional 35 billion in our budget, 35 billion in our budget to a million in our budget to allow us to start building. Excuse me. I would just surprised OMB. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, these are the three things that are on my mind and that informs our work going forward. How do we ensure we don't lose the capabilities we built for COVID but we'll need moving forward? How do we make sure we are funded to start preparing for the next pandemic while we have time to have that head start? And how do we build the infrastructure for ASPR to support us as a new agency moving forward? Anyway, these are the things that keep me up at night, and I'm happy to talk about these or anything else on your mind, and I hope that you are sleeping better than I am. <laughs> yeah, you anticipated my first statement that our mission on the commission should be to help you get a good night's sleep. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we can help make the case um, for you. Incidentally, I, I'm, I wanted to say as a matter of uh, undoubtedly uh, professional parochialism where accustomed to addressing witnesses before this commission as doctor, but you too are a doctor, in this case, a doctor of jurisprudence. And uh, you prove that uh, some lawyers actually can do great things for society. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, so uh, let me, let me um, start with this. Um, part of it is uh, really about how ASPR is improving uh, the healthcare facilities medical surge capacity uh, to respond to special pathogens during uh, public health and medical emergencies. I know that uh, you recently uh, uh, made grants of over $20 million to 13 different healthcare facilities, and I wonder if you could tell us a little more about um, what the money is uh, being used for, what you hope it'll produce. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Um, we have a wonderful program called the RESPTC program. Now, I'm not responsible for the acronyms here, but you get where, where they're, they're going. Yeah. Um, I inherited that acronym. But what it is, it's a special pathogens network. And it was born out of the Ebola work in 2014 uh, when we thought that uh, any hospital in the country could handle an Ebola patient should it show up. And in Dallas, we learned that lesson, that we actually needed specialized hospitals to be prepared to receive and treat Ebola patients. Out of that, we had the Ebola Supplemental, and we were able to launch a network uh, regionally based of highly sophisticated uh, hospitals that were trained and able to take on an Ebola or Ebola-type patient. Uh, you're familiar with Emory, NIH, Nebraska are some examples. We've since grown that network to 13. Um, and we continue to exercise that network. There's a program called the NETEC program, and it's run by those uh, original uh, Ebola treatment centers, the Emory's, NIH, Bellevue, and New York, and they uh, coordinate and make sure that these hospitals are always ready to go, that they have transportation to and from an airport should someone fly in, um, should uh, th that uh, people understand who are working there how to don and doff the PPE. That was one of the problems we had in the Dallas hospital was uh, we had some mistakes being made in how they were taking on and, uh, and, and, and putting on and taking off their PPE, and that led to exposure. So uh, we have a very sophisticated network that we've funded that helps continue to exercise that. And we had a, not a scare. I want to use my words carefully, but we had an opportunity to think very carefully about that program uh, this fall when Ebola Sudan uh, began to circulate in Uganda. And as you know, we currently have no vaccine or therapeutic, though BARDA within ASPR has some um, investigational products that we were making available. Uh, so we were sort of starting from scratch again, much like we were in Dallas in 2014. So we uh, made sure that the hospitals were ready to receive, that we had transportation plans from any of the um, airports where someone might fly in from Uganda, and that we could um, treat a patient who had Ebola uh, Sudan very carefully. So this is a critical component that we support within uh, our national preparedness structure. Good. One, uh, one other question, uh, and it could lead to a long answer, so whatever you're, you want to do. This is about the national stockpile. Uh, and of course, a, a lot of people learned about that we had such a national stockpile through COVID. Uh, coming out of that, lessons learned from that in MPOX, um, uh, w what should our priorities be at um, reconstituting or, or sustaining the national stockpile? What should be in it? And wh what have we learned about how to better distribute its contents 
uh, when the next challenge or crisis comes? Well, sometimes it feels, and people have heard me say before, the stockpile is a little bit like a Rorschach test. People see in it what they want to see, and they're awfully disappointed when whatever they want to see isn't there. And so one of the challenges we have in this preparedness space is making sure that we're diversified against enough of the challenges that might come and that we're prepared to have the supplies needed um, against whatever that challenge might be. The stockpile you know, does have countermeasures that we need against any national security threat. So if it's something that has a material threat determination like an anthrax attack or a smallpox, we've got those um, countermeasures in the stockpile. We also saw at the beginning of COVID when everyone expected there to be uh, PPE, that it only had PPE from, or the vast majority of the PPE was from H1 uh, N1 in the uh, 2010s or right. early 2007s, 8s, 9s, and that it hadn't been replenished and it hadn't been upgraded. So with COVID supplemental dollars, we've been able to purchase PPE uh, and make sure that we have fresh stocks of PPE available for COVID or they would be available for whatever comes next. But a critical component of that is our supply chain work. It's not enough that we have the stock sitting in the stockpile. It's also important that our frontline healthcare workers can get that and access that themselves within our market. And so the investments we're making to be sure that gloves are manufactured in the United States, that face masks are manufactured in the United States, contribute to that preparedness for the stockpile. But one of the challenges, and Senator, you told me I, it, this might be a long answer, so don't let me go no, too go long. Ahead, okay. But if I can suggest one of, one of the challenges um, is I have BARDA within ASPR, which is a terrific organization. It is a preeminent research organization within the federal government responsible for uh, researching and developing countermeasures against these material threats that we see. BARDA is extraordinarily well funded as it should be by Congress. It has captured Congress's imagination. It understands how important it is if we're going to have vaccines and therapeutics that we have a well funded BARDA. But the SNS hasn't been nearly as well funded to keep up with the countermeasures that BARDA is developing. And so BARDA will develop the countermeasures, and if it gets licensed and is successful, um, you know, through, through the FDA process, it will procure one round of it, and then it goes to the stockpile. And then it's up to the stockpile to continue to procure. And the stockpile hasn't been funded to keep up with all of the amazing countermeasures that BARD has been able to develop. So one of the challenges I have in, in, in communicating and making sure Congress understands is that there's a continuum here. It's great for us to be able to develop. In fact, it's fantastic. But if we can't then store and maintain, we're not going to have what we need when we right. need it moving forward. So that's been one of the focuses I've had. That's great. That'll be very helpful to us as we continue our updating of our original report. Thank you very much. Secretary Shalala. Yeah, let me follow up on that because I want to know about the distribution system and the equity issues which we ran into and how you're thinking about that and whether you actually have the authority um, to distribute that stockpile um, and, and how, you're, how you're developing strategies for distributing it in a way in which we don't get the inequities that we saw early on at least. Absolutely. So one of the things that's really been a cornerstone of this administration's COVID response has been equity and access and making sure that all communities that need uh, these very important countermeasures or protective devices have access to them. Um, and the, the president has been very clear with us that we need to transform the stockpile and move forward into a new age. You know, one of my, it, it is a terrific and always has been a terrific resource that we've had, but it sort of sits mothballed between major responses. And what we, and, and that was how we opened it and we saw the H1N1 equipment in there still. What's most important is that we continue to use the stockpile in a way where states and, um, and localities that actually need the uh, resources that we have can access it when they need to and we're continuing to um, exercise that muscle so our uh, state and local leaders understand how to access it, how to get the supplies that they need when they need it in times of emergency, and not just from one major disaster to the next, but actually, for example, we were able to distribute Tamiflu this winter from the stockpile uh, when states were having a hard time getting that with the RSV flu. Some people called it a triple-demic with COVID, um, and Tamiflu was a little harder to come by. The stockpile made some of its stores available, and that was exercising that muscle, getting people used to uh, the fact that we can be helpful here in a sub-Stafford Act or sub-public health emergency situation. But, 
but what you put in the stockpile must depend on how long it can last, and on the, as, which means that you have to make a series of judgments about what goes into the stockpile in terms of not just emergencies, but that it won't be things, certain kinds of things can't be mothballed. That's it. Yep, that's exactly right. We need the funding to be able to maintain anything that's expired and be able to replace. We've got an organization called the FEMC, which is an interagency group that meets and, um, and makes determinations about requirements for how many countermeasures of what sort against which threat we should have in the stockpile. And we're currently reviewing all of our requirements. Some haven't been reviewed in a decade. So really critical to me that coming out of COVID, we have a stockpile that is refreshed and looks forward to whatever threats we think are on the horizon. And of course, it's a scary. And the whole issue of expiration dates, I assume that uh, lots of people are thinking about that as well. Yes, we're very uh, fortunate within the department to have a great relationship with FDA, and they have a shelf life extension program, right. which gives us an opportunity, as you, Secretary, of course, you know all of this, um, th that gives us an opportunity to extend the life of some of the products, and those that don't, we do need funding to be able to replace. Thank yes, thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, Fred, you're next. Well, thank you, and I, I again, want to apologize for not being there in person. Just just a couple of questions. It's, I've only been out of the Congress uh, now about two months, and it, so I've not really officially taken off my congressional hat yet. I was one of the dozen or so Republicans that supported the omnibus back in December so that we did not have to fall back on what otherwise would have been a CR. Uh, I'm, I'm, first of all, thank you for your, your service. Uh, we're, we're with you in trying to achieve the, these goals and so you can get some rest at night for sure. But what would have happened had we ended up with a CR rather than, than the omnibus as it relates to ASPR. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for your support. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, one of the most important things that I talked about in my intro that would have happened is HCOR, which is the DOD logistics and operational expertise that we brought in to ASPR when Operation Warp Speed um, stood down last year. It, it wouldn't have received annual funding. You know, one of the things that I love so much about HHS are the big-hearted policy experts that we have. But when it comes to operations and logistical expertise, there isn't a lot of that, and that's where ASPR comes in. So the fact that we would not have been able to fund HCOR and keep it uh, as part of our response network would have been a real um, challenge for us moving forward. You know, we've seen the, the sophistication HCOR has brought to our ability to procure and move countermeasures across the country very quickly. And so as soon as COVID dollars were, um, were exhausted, HCOR would have had to go away. But because you uh, supported the omnibus and we were able to get annual funding for HCOR, HHS now has this capability moving forward. And I think it'll be critical to wrap up the COVID response and then to move forward um, against any other responses we have. And so the dollar figures that you're asking for, the, the 20 billion, the 400 million, the 30, 35 mi million, listen, I want to be careful. <laughs> yes. uh, there is a difference between an M and a B. Uh, I, I'm glad that the president's budget is now released so that you can talk about that. Uh, if had we had this uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago, I don't think you would have been able to do so. What discussions have you had with the Hill uh, House and Senate uh, as it relates to these figures as, as we try to look at this? I know that both, I think both the House and Senate are going to try to do all 12 appropriation bills. We'll see, ha ha. Uh, but any, any word on the discussions as, as it relates to those re uh, monetary requests? Well, you know, we're keenly aware of how important it is to begin to socialize this early and often with our partners on the Hill. We did a, a four corners briefing uh, with the staff from both appropriations, both sides appropriations um, committees on Friday, and we've got two more briefings this Friday. So we're continuing, uh, and that's just our, our opening salvo. Uh, we have a, a budget hearing coming up in April in which I'll, you know, deliver the same message, and we're continuing to look for every opportunity we can find to engage with Congress. We think it's important for them. I mean, in, in so many ways, Congress allowed us to build the, the terrific things that we've always needed and never had. And it would just be a real shame if because we weren't able to land this next round of funding, we lost all that capability and had to start from scratch.
for the next response. So, you know, this is part of their victory lap, too, in getting out of where we've been and moving forward. And, and if they can see that, uh, that this is part of their success, I, you know, I, I hope we'll, we will be successful in moving these dollars forward. Well, I sure hope so, because good policy doesn't happen without the funding. And the funding is critical to make sure that the good policy uh, comes about. So uh, thank you again for being with us this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Fred. Susan. Two questions. Um, I'll start with, I think, the easier one and then ask the bigger one. Um, first of all, what is um, ASPR's position with respect to what the state's responsibilities are in creating their own state stockpiles, which I've been advocating in Indiana and elsewhere? And so I'm curious um, what you know, what the position is on that, and are we talking about incentivizing the states in some way so there's, it's not just one national strategic stocks pile that the country relies on first? And then secondly, having been very involved in PAPA's last reauthorization, what are your top priorities and opportunities for this PAPA reauthorization? What are your top, you know, top requests? Thank you, Representative. Nice to see you again. Um, for the state stockpiles, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that's so important as the steward of the national stockpile is that we um, have as much support nationwide for people, you know, in the communities that Secretary Shalala mentioned, that we have enough things stockpiled in various places that we're able to do the job that we need. And if that means hospitals having some of their own, if it means states having some of their own, if it means us contributing and supporting and working with and advising. Um, I know our team at the SNS has been doing technical um, consultations with various states who are interested in, in seeing what they should do, how they should do this. We're even doing some internationally. You know, other countries have seen what we've been able to do with the stockpile and are, and are trying to understand if they should be doing something similar. I think one of the things, you know, so we are very supportive in making sure that people that need the capability have the capability, however it is, and if a state would like to, to do that through its own stockpile and if we can be helpful in advising, we will. I think one of the things we've started hearing recently is people have all this PPE now and they don't know what to do with it. And so managing a stockpile, the whole life cycle of it, per Secretary Shalala's point about expiration dates and other things, becomes a critical component, not just of the stockpiling piece, but how do you cycle through that? How do you manage that? If you haven't used all your PPE and it's about to expire, what do you do with it? So there's a lot of technical consultations that we're, we are having and are available to have. Um, but like you, I think we share the common goal. What's most important to us is that people have what they need when they need it. So I pre appreciate that question and happy to continue to talk about, you know, some of your perspective on that. And when it comes to PAPA, so PAPA is critically important to us. It's our authorizing bill. Um, and we're looking at a couple of things. Again, like I said in my opening, it would be uh, just malpractice if I didn't take a look at where we've come and begin to, to strengthen moving forward. And there are three ways in which we're doing that. One, you know, DOD had to come in early on our acquisitions pieces. When we had Operation Warp Speed, and as I talked about, we had the research expertise in-house, but we didn't have that logistical and operational exp ex expertise. We also didn't have the acquisitions authorities that we needed to move as quickly as DOD could. So when we were beginning these conversations with the Pfizer's and Moderna's and needing to enter into vaccine contracts very quickly, in 2020, we entered an MOU with DOD, and DOD did assisted acquisitions for us. What I'm looking for in this PAPA uh, reauthorization is some of those similar authorities that would let me be able to do the things HHS needs to do moving forward. So in this very complex geopolitical landscape, we can let DOD go back to doing DOD things, and HHS can have the authority to move quickly and do HHS things. So that's in the acquisitions bucket. The next bucket is in staffing. We also saw what happened early in the pandemic when FEMA came in, and they were able to surge staff very quickly through direct hiring authorities and other, um, you know, and, and other ways of expediting bringing people on board. We're looking at what it would take for us to have some of those authorities to be able to move quickly against whatever comes next. That also goes into me being an operating division now. I can create a, an HR system. I have some independence to be able to develop an HR system that meets my needs when I need it and not just 
uh, you know, other parts of the department who don't have to staff up in emergencies. They can move a little bit slower, but I can actually build capability for ASPR moving forward. Um, and then finally, we're looking at processes. You know, this will be, uh, you know, is it the fourth PAPA now, fourth or fifth? And so we've had many cycles of this where we've been told uh, that we need to have various reports to Congress, which of course we agree with, but we'd like to line them up with some level of consistency in the processes, and so looking for some process improvements. We've also had three wonderful advisory committees, uh, one dealing with uh, emergencies in people with disabilities, one dealing with emergencies in seniors, and one dealing with emergencies in children, and we'd like to have those reauthorized. We think we're better when we get the advice and consent of those outside who are experiencing this firsthand and are able to inform the work we're doing in, in, in our response work. So we're looking to have those um, reauthorized for another cycle. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Susan. Jim Greenwood. Thank you. Um, I just want to understand something, uh, make sure I got it right. I think you said something like, we know what this, the, um, was it seven most likely virus families are? And that, and that knowing that, then the one thing you want, next thing you want to do is you want to do prototypes of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics for each of those seven. Could you just explain the science of that a little bit so I understand? You know, how do you, how do you, these are families and they could have variants as we know. And so what does a prototype look like? And, and <clears throat> has that done, been done before? Is this, is this a new idea to do this? Thank you. So there's some agreement among the experts, uh, including a, a WHO list that gets published every year. Our um, BARDA experts, NIH experts, have been tracking seven viral families that um, are mostly, you know, pandemic potential. So they're ones that are most likely to spread explosively if they get started. Um, and these it, are within the animal kingdom somewhere? Is right, that? so like the, the filoviruses, which are the Ebola and hemorrhagic fevers, the uh, coronaviruses, which we're currently experiencing right now, those are examples, you know, Zika is an arbovirus, you know, so it's the various viral families that are more likely to, be, not all viruses are gonna explode with transmission and cause a, likely to cause a epidemic or pandemic, but some of them will, and we know which ones those are, and we've identified seven that we'd like to focus on. Um, and much like we've done with the coronavirus now, where we have this mRNA prototype that we can pull off the shelf if we need to again, we'd like to begin to develop um, vaccines against the other viral families, and we would just pick one of the, the viruses within that family to focus on, because the understanding is, and I'm not a vaccinologist, but my understanding from those that are, is that if you have a particular platform for a vaccine that works against a particular family, it will work against the others in that family as well. So we now know the mRNA can work against the coronavirus. We're looking for next generation vaccines as well that might have a little more durability against the coronavirus. But to get us started, we know an mRNA would work. Um, we know in the, um, there's a VSV for Ebola. So VSV is probably the platform that we would look at for the filoviruses. But it's identifying within vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, what is that platform that's most likely to work to do the test now while we have some time, and then know that we can pull off that prototype um, and, and ramp up manufacturing very quickly should a, a, a virus take hold. And if there are seven families, um, and you said you would start with one, is that a, a, a as opposed to starting the, doing all seven simultaneously, is that a, just a resource issue? Well, we would start with as many as we can afford to. We've asked for 20 billion, but this is actually part of that larger pandemic preparedness ask that we had last year, which was for much more. It was upward in 80 billion. And so we've definitely scaled that back. We understand from Congress, we hear from Congress that that was um, too much money to ask for all at once. So we brought it down to 20 billion. 10 billion of that would, would jumpstart this work uh, in ASPR through BARDA. And we would take on as many as we could at one time. We'd have to look at what the projects are, how much they would cost, and try to stretch across each of those the, the best we could. But it would certainly be the down payment that we need to get started. And we're anxious to get started. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank, thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks, uh, Secretary O'Connell. You were, you were uh, great. And, you, and what you're doing is really important. So um, uh, you weren't here at the beginning. Maybe somebody told you we called this uh, hearing uh, Please look up to contrast with the movie. Don't look up. Uh, in other words, uh, the, uh, we worry, as I, I know from your testimony, you do, that the particularly the end of the, the public health emergency about COVID will sort of lead us to turn on to the next 
problem or decide, hey, we don't have to spend that money anymore. But you've really made quite clear that uh, that would be a very foolish thing to do. And without some level of continuing support for the programs that you uh, lead and oversee, we're going to end up being unprepared uh, next time. So I, I appreciate uh, your leadership and also the quality of your testimony. I'd say finally about all the witnesses that I said at the beginning that this uh, 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 foundational report that we put out in 2015 and that we're now um, going to update uh, turned out to be very predictive only because we listened to the experts. <laughs> And uh, we've had some wonderful expert testimony today, uh, including um, from you, but also uh, uh, people that, that uh, ASPR has and, and your constituent agencies have made possible. So uh, we'll try our best to listen to them and be constructive in the, uh, in the update. Uh, the, the next uh, public meeting of our commission uh, on this uh, focus on the, on the update of our report uh, will be on May 9th, and on that occasion, we'll be focusing on prevention, uh, deterrence, and attribution of biological events. So uh, we look forward to seeing everybody who's here return again. Mark your calendars. And okay, thank you. Uh, this will adjourn the meeting with thanks to uh, my fellow commissioners, our extraordinary staff, people who testified, and all of you who have been good enough to show interest by coming out today. Thank you very much.